table and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance, which tonight will be led by Council Member Fox. In uh, placing your hand over your heart and ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America. All right, and if you would please remain standing for an invocation. Um, I believe we have with us this evening uh, uh, Sheikh Atef Magu, religious director of the Islamic Center of Irvine. There he is. Please join us, and we thank you for the invocation. Thank you. In the name of God, the most merciful, they were merciful. All praise belong to you. You are the holder of the heavens and the earth and whatever is in them. All praise belongs to you. You are the possession. You are in possession of the heavens and the earth and whatever is in them. All praise belongs to you. You are the lights of the heavens and the earth. And all the praises are for you. You are the truth. Your promise is the truth. Your meeting is the truth. Your word is the truth. We ask you and we surrender our will to you. We believe in you. We depend on you and repent to you. We ask you to bless our city, the city of Irvine. We ask you to spread peace, harmony, and compassion between people from all different backgrounds and culture. We ask you to bless us, bless everyone here in this room, bless our families. We ask you to protect us from anxiety and from grief. We ask you to protect us from laziness and inability. We ask you to have mercy on us and, and also in our families. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, Sheikh uh, Magoub. Thank you for gracing us with tonight's invocation. Mm -hmm. All right, it's my pleasure now to invite uh, Kia Mortazavi, Executive Director of Planning of the Orange County Transportation Authority, to come forward. Tonight, Mr. Mortazavi is here to provide an update on OCTA's long-range transportation plan. Uh, thank you, sir, for joining us, and the uh, floor is yours. Okay, good evening, Mayor Wagner and council members. I'm Greg Nord. Kia couldn't make it tonight. Oh, I'm the project never mind. <laughs> I'm the project manager for the long-range transportation plan at OCTA. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to be here. Um, today, I would like to walk you through some of the major elements of the 2018 long-range transportation plan, or LRTP. Uh, which was finalized just last November, and I'd like to begin with just touching on the uh, purpose of the uh, long-range plan. Get it up. Okay. Uh, OCTA updates the LRTP every four years uh, to evaluate how well our plan improvements address the travel needs over the next 20 to 25 years. And we do this by evaluating our current set of plans and policies identifying new initiatives that we may want to take over the next several years. And we also use it to define our set of projects um, that we submit to the Southern California Association of Governments for inclusion in the regional transportation plan. And it's important that our projects are included in the regional transportation plan so they're eligible for state and federal funding and so that they can proceed through the uh, project development process. In developing the LRTP, we must uh, consider stakeholder input, revenue forecasts, our current commitments to delivering the Measure M program as well as uh, transit service throughout the county. And we also have to consider uh, socioeconomic changes, and that's really one of the biggest change, uh, challenges to uh, long range planning. Oops, we good? All right. <laughs> um, so between 2015 and 2040, Orange County's population is expected to grow by over 300,000 residents and our employment's expected to grow by about 275,000 jobs. 
And so to understand that how this impacts the transportation system, we looked at uh, a 2015 base year, which represents our existing conditions, and it's in the uh, far left column there. And we compared that to a 2040 no-build scenario that accounts for all the demographic changes, uh, but assumes that just the 2015 transportation network uh, continues forward. And so if we, if we only assume that the 2015 network is maintained, we can expect to see that uh, about a 66% increase in congestion by 2040. And so over the next few slides, I'll discuss our vision for addressing this growth, beginning with uh, highway improvements. Uh, so uh, currently we have about 1,700 lane miles of freeways and, and toll roads throughout the county. And we're looking to expand our freeway network by about uh, 214 lane miles, which is about a 13% increase. And those improvements are shown in orange on the map here on the right. And you can also see a breakdown of the different types of uh, lane additions on the various facilities throughout the county in the table on the left. Um, <clears throat> this also includes uh, more pertinent to Irvine, uh, improvements to SR55 between the I-405 and I-5. And we are also planning uh, for improvements between the spectrum and SR55 on both the I-5 and I-405, all of which will help to relieve congestion from the local roads. Uh, however, even, or excuse me, uh, the transportation corridor agencies also have uh, a number of winding projects throughout their existing uh, system, shown in purple on the map, which will add about 150 lane miles. But even with all these improvements to the freeway system and the toll roads, uh, Caltrans still expects that there will be a need to move to a, an express toll lane system uh, utilizing our existing um, carpool lane network. And this is to address uh, federal performance standards that require that carpool lanes operate at about 45 miles per hour during peak periods. So OCTA is planning to work closely with Caltrans to further study that concept over the coming years. Uh, moving on to local roads. Uh, today we have about 6,400 lane miles and we're looking to expand that, uh, working closely with local jurisdictions and with support from Measure M, uh, expand that by about 650 lane miles or roughly 10% increase. And we also recognize that the local roads carry about half the vehicle miles traveled throughout the county, and so it's important to maintain their efficiency. And so the Long Range Transportation Plan also carries forward the signal synchronization program that's part of our Measure M program. Um, this has shown about 13% reduction in travel time and 15% increase in speeds uh, from our uh, corridors that have been implemented to date. And uh, there have been about 13 uh, synchronization projects in Irvine so far. Uh, for active transportation, the LRTP proposes continued coordination with local jurisdictions to expand uh, the bikeways network by about 58% throughout the county, making bicycling a more attractive and viable choice. Uh, over the past several years, OCTA and local jurisdictions have been working together to a, plan a uh, regional bikeways network, which is shown on the map here on the right. And uh, we've had some success uh, with um, making progress on implementing that, specifically on the uh, OC loop section, which is highlighted on the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, that's up in northern, the northern part of the county. And with that success, we're trying to carry that over into other parts of the county. And so OCTA is now uh, developing a uh, regional connectors program, uh, building off the regional corridors that were identified on the previous map. And this uh, includes um, the cross county connector shown in gold, uh, the central and south county connector shown in purple and blue, all of which uh, pass through uh, the city of Irvine and serve the uh, Irvine Transportation Center and the uh, uh, Spectrum Business Area. Um, Uh, to support growth in bus ridership, OCTA has initiated the OC Bus 360 program to focus resources on high demand areas, primarily in central and northern Orange County. And we're also building off this with uh, plans, uh, planning effort called the OC Transit Vision, which we recently concluded um, that identified 11 high frequency corridors that are shown on this map. Uh, the city staff at Irvine is currently participating in OCTA's Bristol Corridor Study. and. Uh, uh, this is evaluating transit connections that will come down in, into the John Wayne Airport area and uh, the, the surrounding business area. 
Uh, the Trans Division also includes the OC Streetcar uh, serving uh, Santa Ana, and that's shown on the inside on the left-hand side of the slide. And we also have our OC Flex on-demand shuttle service, which we've uh, begun pilot programs on in Laguna Niguel and Huntington Beach. And if those are successful, we'll look to expand those to other parts uh, of the county. So altogether, the strategy increases transit service by about 30% by 2040. And I should also note that the LRTP assumes uh, continued support for the uh, ice shuttle program here in the city. OCTA is also coordinating with Metrolink to improve commuter rail service on the three lines serving Orange County, uh, including about 18 additional trains that will serve the Irvine Transportation Center. And in total, serving Orange County will be going from about 54 trains today to roughly 86 trains by 2040. And Metrolink is also introducing their tier four locomotive, which is uh, more efficient and helps to reduce emissions in the county. Uh, looking at the uh, performance of the investments, we can see here that uh, under the trend 2040 column, which is highlighted in, or in orange, uh, and comparing that to the 2040 no build scenario, uh, uh, the trend 2040 scenario, the investments that I just went over uh, perform better in all the metrics shown here. And uh, so we can see that congestion is down. You can go forward one. Um, congestion's down, uh, transit trips are up, and speeds are up on both freeways and arterial roadways. So this shows that, uh, can you hit it one more? Uh, shows that um, it nearly maintains the 2015 travel conditions despite over 1.7 million trips being added to the system each day. And so we can see that these investments are helping to mitigate that growth that we talked about earlier in the, in the presentation uh, that resulted in the 66% increase in congestion. Recognizing that there's still more work that can be done, uh, we also include a short-term action plan that identifies these four uh, categories that OCTA will focus on over the next uh, two to three years leading up to the next long-range transportation plan. And so we have our Orange County planning activities, working with our local jurisdictions and, uh, and uh, moving forward with our projects. We have regional planning activities, so working with uh, the Southern California Association of Governments and surrounding counties, uh, studying emerging issues and looking for opportunities to implement those throughout the county, and uh, coordinating on out outreach and education efforts to promote uh, trip planning, transit use, and safety throughout the system. Uh, some specific actions that OCTA will be taking in the near term. Um, well, we're currently working with the Southern California Association of Governments and uh, other partner agencies on developing the 2020 Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, we'll also be working to advance the uh, plan projects and short-term action plan elements, which include the freeway projects I mentioned earlier on the 55, 5, and I-405 as well as completing the Bristol Transit Street Corridor, for which OCT will be back here to present on, I think, later uh, in the summer. Uh, all of these efforts will then be reflected in the 2022 Long Range Transportation Plan that we anticipate uh, initiating in late 2020. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And let me bring it back to the council, uh, uh, Council Member Shea. I've got it. Go. We've got a new system here. It gets a little frustrating. Um, anyway, I want to thank you so much for um, attending our meeting, giving this update. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's uh, so important. Our regional transportation and uh, solving our transportation issues is paramount to all of our residents across Orange County. A couple things. One, I want to thank you so much for the bike lanes. I think many of us appreciate that. You've expanded it like 1,300 um, or 11, is it 1130 miles? Is that what it is? It will be, yes. Okay, so oh, I yeah, thought it was 2015. Today, yeah. Yes, what I thought. Um, but I appreciate that. I know many of us appreciate that because we do workouts. A lot of our residents ride bikes, and it's important that we see that connectivity. Um, would you explain a little bit in more detail when you talked about express toll lanes? Uh, you went over that briefly, but what exactly does that mean to um, Orange County residents, to Irvine residents? What is, what is an express lane so they understand that? And what 
I believe there's ob obviously cost to that. So can you go into more detail what OCT is doing in regard to express toll lanes? Right. The basic concept is the carpool lanes would be uh, moved to a, a three plus requirement rather than two plus. Um, we study that Which as means three people in a car, not two. Is that three, correct? Yeah, three people okay. in a car to enter the lanes and they can use them for free at that, at that point. Um, through our study, we did an initial analysis as part of the, the long range plan which showed that if you did that, the lanes would be grossly underutilized. So there'd, you know, there'd be a car every few seconds going by while everyone else is sitting in, in traffic. And so the idea is if you allow people to buy their way in, if they have two passengers or less, um, that could help free up um, some of the general purpose lane traffic and give a more reliable uh, trip time in the express lanes. So where do we see these express lanes being implemented? Because I know I've heard people concerned about the fact that our tax dollars go to build highways and now we're gonna have to pay to be on the freeway to move faster. So can you explain where these express toll lanes are gonna be implemented? Right, it would, it would be a conversion of the, exi of the uh, carpool lane network that's out there today. And so Caltrans is, is talking about moving in that direction in order to meet that uh, federal standard that I mentioned that requires carpool lanes operate at 45 miles per hour. And so there, Caltrans is required to uh, put a plan together on how they uh, plan to meet that. Currently right. about 80% of the system doesn't meet that. And so their strategy is to move towards this express lane network. And what could you give more, I'm just trying to get the um, background. So where are these express toll lanes gonna be implemented? It would be on, on all the freeways where there are currently, uh, where there are current or planned uh, carpool lane facilities. So pretty much our entire uh, freeway network has carpool, lane, uh, carpool lanes on them. There's a couple small segments that don't have them yet, but the idea would be anywhere there's carpool lanes, they'd be converted to the express toll lane. So we won't then in the future have, you know, free carpool lanes. They would, you, if you wanted to get in them, you would have to pay. If you have three or more people in the car, you right. can use it for free. Okay. If you have less, then you would uh, pay to use it. Has there been a calculation at all at this point in time? I know it may be premature about what the cost would be to use these lanes. Uh, not at this time. We, they would have to be evaluated kind of like a corridor by corridor uh, okay. study. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your coming and updating us. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. All right, we're gonna move now, it sounds loud, sorry, to item 2.2. And uh, we did not have Mr. Mortazavi here with us, so I have no idea who's here for the next event. But I'm told it's Alex Tardy. We have Mr. Tardy here, come on up. Let me invite forward Alex Tardy, meteorologist from the National Weather Service. Joining Mr. Tardy will be staff members from uh, Public Safety's Office of Emergency Management, as well as staff from our public works and transportation departments. Mr. Tardy is here this evening to recognize the collaborative efforts by the city in preparing Irvine for weather-related emergencies, which has long been a priority for the city. National Weather Service declares a city as, quote, storm ready based on its efforts in key areas, which include weather monitoring, alert and warning systems, communication redundancies, community emergency response team training, public outreach and education, and emergency operations center capabilities. Thank you, Mr. Tardy, for joining us this evening, and thank you to staff as well for your collaborative efforts in assuring that, <coughs> excuse me, that Irvine is uh, well prepared for weather-related emergencies. Sir, the podium is yours. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, I work at NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, National Weather Service. So we're responsible for the good weather and the bad weather. Um, but in all seriousness, our, our main goal is to protect lives and property, and speaking of transportation, to improve the economy and how things flow and how the commerce uh, is delivered. So we work closely with emergency management, like Scott um, and like Bobby, on my right here. And the idea is to work with emergency management to start a plan a week before a storm hits, five days before, three days before, 24 hours before, 
And so the, also the idea is to have one message, one forecast, one piece of information so that they can make decisions and they can turn it around and work with public works and then they can prepare for each individual storm. It may be a Santa Ana wind, so we're talking about wildfires. It may be heavy rain, so we're talking about flooding on all our freeways. It could be just plain extremely hot temperatures, so we're talking about cooling centers, that type of thing. So all different types of weather. As a federal agency, our goal with the Storm Ready Program, which is what they're being recognized for, is to work closer with state, with county, and then with city emergency management, whether it be fire, police, public works, so that we can all work to make the city a little bit more prepared and, of course, a little bit more resilient because we're not going to stop the weather disasters, we're not going to stop the heavy rain, the wind, that type of thing, but the idea is to make us a little bit more resilient. So I'm happy to uh, recognize the city of Irvine uh, and the Emergency Management Department with a plaque here recognizing their NOAA Storm Ready Certificate. We also have um, an official sign that designates the city and can be put out in a public uh, area so residents like yourself and others that don't know about National Weather Service, don't know about emergency management in the police department um, can also see that the city is doing one extra step to prepare for whatever the weather might give us, whether it be dry weather, hot weather, rain or wind uh, in our region. So that's the official sign there for the city of Irvine. And finally, um, we also uh, provide for the city for the emergency. Some of you may not be familiar with emergency management, but they have an emergency operations center um, that they activate when needed during storms, uh, before or after or during storms. And part of that um, is having the alert radio, which delivers messages 24-7 uh, when it's actually urgent. For you, uh, you may be familiar with messages that come to your smartphone, and those are called wireless emergency alerts. This is the legacy emergency alert system, and for you, the phone messages that we send out are the wireless emergency alerts. The whole idea is to make us pay attention, wake us up, we got busy lives, lots of things going on, and to pay attention to weather when it actually does matter. Um, and how appropriate, because we've actually had some very active weather this winter. Thank you. Tardy, thank you, the National Weather Service. Why don't you get in there for a for a pick, real quick? You want to get everyone out? Just so yeah, it's probably going to be. Easy Mr. To Mayor, if we could, I I'd like to know who the members of the team are, if they could tell us their name, and so that our our, our that residents is a all. Fair request. Somebody want to introduce the team? No. We can step up. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is uh, Bobby Simmons. I am the Emergency Management Administrator uh, here with the City of Irvine House within the Police Department. And uh, I'm just, I'm pleased to be here tonight uh, accepting this uh, award on behalf of the team. You wanna come on? I'm Vujran with Public Works. Good evening, Ty Richter, Street Division with Public Works. Scott Tullius with the Office of Emergency Management. Eduardo Lopez with the Irvine Traffic Management Center. My name is Casey Natt, Landscape Supervisor with Public Works. Weather is our life. Joel Miller, Supervisor, Facility Maintenance, Public Works. Laurent F Ferguson, Public Works, uh, Traffic Signals, Street Lighting. Good evening, my name is Michael Kent. I'm a Commander with the Irvine Police Department. I oversee our emergency management services. Thank you all.
All right, thank you. We're at item 2.3. The presentation was agendized at the request of Council Member Kahn, and so at this point I will turn the uh, floor over to her to introduce the item and invite our guests forward. Thank you, Mayor. On March 3rd, um, I attended the OC Chefs Table event, an annual fundraiser for the Illumination Foundation to raise funds for their emergency housing program. This organization was founded in 2007 and in just 2018 has served 1,884 people. At the event, I was moved by one of the video presentations and thought it would be helpful for our residents and community to understand the plight of our homeless community and the possibilities out there to break the cycle of homelessness. And now I would like to invite um, CEO and President Paul Leon to provide us with the presentation. Albert Einstein said, the world is a dangerous place, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. If. 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 But the basic comforts we take for granted were suddenly gone. If I couldn't find another job as quickly as I thought. If I was hungry and didn't have any money to buy food to eat. What would I do? If I get separated from my family. And there was no place to go. If I needed to use the bathroom. And all the bathrooms were for paying customers only. If I needed a hot shower and there was no place to go. If we needed a warm place to escape the rain and cold. And there were no rooms left. Where would we sleep? If I fall asleep, will someone hurt me again? If I have to stay awake to protect my kids, I'll stay awake all night. You don't really know about a person's life until you walk in their shoes. It could happen to anyone. It was very surreal watching that house burn down. Every single day was a struggle to find a place to stay. When we came to California to flee, domestic violence. We didn't have a place to go, so we um, slept on a train station bench all night. It's just me to take care of that little boy. There's no family anymore, so it's just me. It's scary. I had to bathe my son with his baby wipes for the longest time, and that doesn't keep you clean enough. That was really hard, knowing that I couldn't keep my son clean the way that I needed to. It's been a lot of going from place to place, different cities, different shelters, different bus stations to sleep. Um, it's been cold nights. It's been times when, you, when we didn't have food. It's been 24 hours sometimes walking on the street. We walk so much, and you know, my daughter has chronic tendonitis in both of her feet now. If the condition doesn't get better, she could end up in a wheelchair. So I found a youth shelter to put my daughter in, and I had a really big fear that I might lose her. Well, when we began and started working with families, there were obvious solutions, and one of them was housing. We were really surprised at the fact that one house could have an impact for over 300 families. I think the takeaway for us was that homelessness was solvable. I'm looking at this house like, oh my gosh, this, this is where I get to stay. Like, they're gonna pull me off the streets and put me here. The day I arrived, was such a relief. I had hope again. I made arrangements to go get my daughter out of where she was because we were all wanting to reunite and be back together again. And they said, this is your room. I said, just for me? 
I was in awe. Even the most elaborate and beautiful words don't really describe the feeling. The greatest gift ever is being able to shower every day and having heat and having a bed to sleep in that's actually comfortable. Never underestimate what a group of concerned citizens can do. We've seen the effect of one person, one volunteer, one advocate, one donor change hundreds of lives. We have limited resources and limited housing and a lot of families and a lot of families with children. These are families, they're friends, and their neighbors, and that if we don't take care of them, who will? There's nine families in this house, and there are 80 families waiting. Those 80 families that are waiting for this house are out there like I was and my son was. The need is, is so high, and there's just not enough room for everybody. That is not okay. We need to do more. If I shared some of what I have. If I shared some of what I have. If I shared some of what I have. If I did something. To make a difference. To make a difference. If, if we, we all, all work together. together. If we all work together. If we all work together. If we all work together. If, 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 if we all work together. If we work together as a community, it is a solvable problem. Illumination Foundation saved people's lives. It saved my life. It saved my son's life because it saved my life. We really need you, all of us out there. We really need you. Please. 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 Thank you, Mayor, Councilman. Um, again, I think this is a reminder to let us know that the homeless population, obviously I don't need to tell you, has ballooned and we're in a crisis situation. Um, but that was one house, they weren't actors. Our film um, videographer came on a Saturday and just filmed. But we've had 300 families go through that house per year. And 70% of them are in permanent housing now. But one thing that I hope we remember, currently, you know, the, the numbers are gonna come out for the point in time count, but we're estimating that there's between 5,000 and 6,000 individuals out in Orange County. The fastest growing population that we're seeing are seniors. We opened up a shelter for Anaheim. We put 200 people in there. 130 came and showed up within the first week and a half. We had five 84-year-old ladies there. We had more ladies than men, and we, our average age of the people that came in the shelter was 54. So we just opened our second shelter for Anaheim with 100 um, individuals. And again, in that shelter, we have 
three to four people that are over the age of 70. So it, it's not just what you see in the riverbed. There's families, there's children. Currently we have 81 individuals and we have a current list that we could call every day and those people will answer. Um, most of them with children, most of them in cars or motels temporarily, um, but all of them for the emergency house. Our waiting list right now is 81. It went up to 83, 83 um, a few weeks ago, but it's remained at 81. So again, we uh, just moved to Orange, but we were in Irvine and we've had incredible support um, from where Mayor Wagner and um, the council. And I just wanna thank you for, um, and, and thank Councilwoman Khan to let us show you, to just remember that it's not, um, you know, just individuals that there's families involved. And once again, it's solvable. And, and like the kids said, it, we all have to be working on this together. So thank you. All right, well, thank you and job well done. Are there questions of Mr. Leon from any of my colleagues? All right, um, seeing none, yes, I did have an opportunity, as you know, we, we toured one of your facilities and I thank you for the, uh, the hospitality. The work you're doing is critical, it is, it is great. And out in the communities, those, those are, are resources. They are um, absolute community resources. And so thank you for the work that you're doing. Right, All thank right. you. All right, thank you, thank you all. All right, um, we are uh, at this point gonna turn it over to the city manager. Are there any reports to be made this evening? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council members. Uh, city's travel policy requires that upon the travel, particularly out of the country, of uh, the city manager on city business that a report immediately follow thereafter at the first available council meeting. And so tonight I am reporting on two, uh, two trips that I've made since the beginning of uh, February on behalf of the city. Uh, the first was to London uh, as part of a delegation that was organized by the Greater Irvine Chamber of Commerce. The second was a trip to Sacramento. And so uh, first let's report on the trip and the delegation and... Uh, the uh, excursion to London to recruit businesses to Irvine. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to our partners at the Greater Irvine Chamber of Commerce to report on that trip because it is, as you know, Mr. Mayor, having uh, been there yourself the year before, uh, this is an ongoing program that has had uh, yielded some really promising and, uh, and real results for us. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. DiMario of the Chamber. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Mayor, Council, uh, we know you have a full evening uh, before you, uh, but we w really wanted to do uh, John Russo and Caitlin Wynn justice for their uh, attention and for their participation in the FDI program. Uh, I just want to share a brief overview. Uh, we do this uh, because we believe in creating sustainable economic vitality for Irvine. And by bringing new companies to enhance and expand our life science and technology sectors, we create more economic opportunity as well as jobs for our residents, our children, and our grandchildren. The first uh, was 2017. Our job was simply to put Irvine on the radar. Every company that we met with or I talked with in all the previous years, they talked about Boston, they talked about Silicon Valley, they knew nothing in spite of our amazing reputation. And so it was our job to say, you need to know who we are and what we are and how good we are for you and your company. That first year we visited with 40 companies, London, Manchester, and Cambridge, and we built and leveraged some amazing relationships with in-country associations and organizations. So when we're not there, they are speaking of us and speaking well of us and making referrals to us. In 2018, it was about gaining traction with expansion-ready companies. 
We had 21 companies that we met with. Mayor Wagner was with us on that trip, and he knows that I put the delegation through their paces. <laughs> it is a very intense experience. 21 uh, meetings. Uh, I returned in June, July to meet with those companies. 10 companies, 15 founders and CEOs attended our October Life Science Showcase. Six company referrals have already been made to Irvine by UK companies who attended the showcase. And five companies have already indicated an intent to expand in Irvine. And then moving forward to 2019, and this is where Mr. Russo joined us as well as Caitlin Wynn, this was about accelerating the pipeline of UK companies, continuing to promote Irvine to expansion-ready companies. And it was clear, and every delegate who was with us in previous missions will tell you, we now had gained traction. We had a reputation. These companies were actually eager to speak with us, and they knew where Irvine and Orange County was. So we've made much ground. We continue to build that competitive reputation so that when they say Boston, we say Irvine. We met with 22 expansion-ready companies. We are already working with 10 priority number one companies that are ready for expansion. Site visits have already, we've already had one site visit in March. We have two coming in in April. We have one in May, one in June. And then we have five companies that will be joining us for our 2019 Life Science Showcase in October. As these announcements are confirmed to our satisfaction, we will be very pleased to share this progress with you. But we want you to know how much we appreciate the attention of the city, the mayor, the council, and of course having uh, Mr. Russo and Caitlin join us because the credibility that they bring, in addition to the depth of our delegation, that a mayor of a city or a city manager of a city would actually uh, attend and participate in this, these companies were mightily impressed. And that's what other big league cities do. So we were very pleased to present that impression. I just wanted to share this photo. This is John talking with our U.S. Embassy Minister for Commercial Affairs, John Simmons. He is a great fan and advocate for Irvine, and he's been very, very helpful, uh, both in terms of referrals as well as data and research. So with that, I will just say thank you. And John, if you'd like to say anything else, but I do have two things real quickly. Leave Oakland with Edwards Life Sciences, who has been with us in our delegation from the beginning, threw out her back last night, unfortunately. She was going to be here today. But she had a statement she wanted me to make. As you know, Edwards is a major proponent of community investment and understands the value of strengthening the life science ecosystem in Irvine. Currently the number one employer of medical device workers in the world, Irvine is a magnet for the brightest scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs. And the FDI mission, launched in 2017, shines a light on this innovative community, and it bolsters Irvine's reputation as a place to expand and thrive. I was there in 2017 at the beginning as a representative of Edwards, we continue to support this initiative. And in the past three years, we've seen this initiative grow from an idea to a reality, bringing five to six new life science companies to the Irvine area, with many more considering expansion in the coming months. And she also wanted to say that we're inspired with the collaboration between the chamber and the city, as Mayor Wagner and city manager John Russo shared their time and energy with prospective UK life science companies ready to expand, highlighting Irvine's commitment to their transition and success. Leap Oakland, Senior Director, Government Affairs. And with your permission, we have with us Sesha Nirvanan with Allergan, who joined our delegation this year to share his perspective with you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, thank you for inviting me for uh, sharing my perspective. Uh, this was my first, uh, so I'm Session Irvanan, Senior Vice President of uh, Research and Development, Allergan. As you may know, Allergan has been uh, an Irvine-grown uh, uh, company for over 70 years. Uh, it's now a global company, but uh, Irvine, our Irvine campus is the biggest campus uh, in, our, in our company with over 2,000 people employed here. Um, I joined uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, Board of Directors this year and, and was lucky to uh, go on this mission. 
Um, and and one, of, one of my passions is to promote, uh, and also as a city uh, uh, resident, uh, the, the infrastructure we have, the, the uh, ecosystem we have when it comes to um, medical uh, science, um, uh, biotech, pharma, medic medical devices, and, and the whole uh, life sciences uh, ecosystem. Uh, it is very underappreciated. Uh, as I've been in the industry for over 25 years, uh, working at many places, uh, other cities have promoted it uh, very well, and I think we have a hidden gem in Irvine that we can showcase uh, much better. And and what the city, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and the City of Irvine has done over the last few years have been fantastic. And I saw it, um, you know, live at, at the show at the mission in, in London, where the companies were, you know, not only uh, eager to meet with us, but were uh, but wanted to follow up with us soon after, and and. Um, and they, they were curious to see what we have to offer and recognize the, the, uh, not only the interest we have, but also the rich um, uh, workforce that we have in the life sciences industry with, with the universities and, and, with, uh, and with companies like Edwards and Allergan who've been here for 70 years and we've had employees who've been with us for, I have employees in my organization who've been with Allergan for 40 years. Uh, so they've stayed with us, and, and so it's, it's a very rich environment, great uh, place to live, not as expensive as, as some of the other uh, big biotech hubs like Boston and, and in San Francisco. Uh, many, many reasons, great weather, better weather than Boston for sure. Uh, you know, so what's not to like? Uh, so I think we, it's, it's a great start, and, and I, I hope uh, that, that we continue this mission and, and continue to promote Irvine to bring these businesses. It's great for the economy here and great for uh, the education system we have for students to find uh, jobs. So, and I thank the uh, uh, city of Irvine representatives as well who came uh, with us, and, and it was, it was a, a, lot of, a lot of education for us and a lot of fun as well to promote Irvine. All right, thank you. Continue. Thank you. So I was in Sacramento for the last week of February, after, right after the last city council meeting, and I want to provide now a brief update to you, council members, and the community on that. Uh, during, that uh, during that period, I was joined by Deputy City Manager Grettenberg for 15 meetings that were attended on February 27 and February 28. Uh, we met with the governor's office staff, various legislators, legislative staff, key departments, and other state officials, including State Treasurer Fiona Ma and Secretary of State Alex Padilla, who both accepted my invitation to visit Irvine and address this council and report to this council before the year end. Uh, most likely, we're hoping to have Treasurer Ma here in the spring and Secretary of State Padilla here in the fall. We covered a number of priority areas, but the two primary areas that we addressed in our trip was number one, the State Veterans Cemetery, and two, we provided an update to the various legislators on the progress, and we also shared ideas with them regarding projects in the cultural terrace that we're working on. The focus was mainly on the State Veterans Cemetery, as the city is considering providing valuable land for this important project. We were seeking the state's commitment to fund the state-owned and operated facility because it will be a state cemetery, and there's a long way to go. There's $5 million that was committed a couple of years ago, and uh, at this point, that's not going to be enough to get it done. We did make, I thought, great progress in moving this decision-making forward. There is much support for the project, as you might imagine, and many are willing to help get this project really firmly entrenched, not only as an idea, but as a reality uh, that both land and finance. Uh, Follow-up discussions will include um, uh, site visits, a return to Sacramento later this year as well. I will be sure to keep the city council apprised of these efforts. Just as a, a marker to put a pin in this, uh, Deputy City Manager Grettenberg and I will be in Washington, D.C. next week to discuss some of the same issues that are important to Irvine at the federal level, most importantly, the State Veterans Cemetery. There is some federal money that can be accessed to do that, uh, as well as other matters, and I will provide an update upon my return. Um, and for that trip to Washington, D.C., although it hasn't been decided yet, uh, we may be joined by the mayor. So with that, 
Uh, that is the end of my report for this meeting. Thank you very much, council members. All right, thank you. Do any of my colleagues have any reports or announcements? Councilmember Quo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, two things. Today is National Girl Scout Day. I don't think we have any Girl Scouts with us, but as you are going home and you're going to a grocery store, be kind, have a $5 bill in your pocket in case they ask you to buy cookies. Um, and on that line, I notice in the back, if my eyes don't deceive me, um, we have some special guests from a local Boy Scout troop, so I wanted to make sure they were acknowledged. Um, I have two planned announcements. Um, and I had some slides, so were we able to get those up? All right, so recently I went to the Woodbridge High School Spring Musical, which was Little Shop of Horrors. It's not as scary of a play as one might think it was, um, but I was blown away by our local talent, and so I wanted to keep the community apprised of two opportunities this week. University High School is uh, performing its Spring Musical, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, those shows will be March 14th, 15th, and 16th at 7 p.m. And the other um, performance will be Portola High School and their presentation of The Adams Family. That will be March 14th, 15th, and 16th at 7 p.m. And Saturday the 16th, a matinee at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Fox. Thank you. It gets confusing moving around. Yeah, which is which. Uh, well, I was able to participate in with myself and the executive director of the Irvine Community Land Trust in a trip to Sacramento last week as well. And I wanted to just briefly report on what happened there. Uh, the Irvine Community Land Trust is seeking an exemption or a waiver of property taxes during the construction period for affordable housing so it's such that uh, permanent affordable housing will be taxed at the permanent affordable valuation rather than fair market value. So for example, if it takes one to three years to build the property, we'll have, uh, we won't be taxed at the fair market value of the acreage, which was approximately $3 million an acre. Um, so these were, these were making our um, balances decline. So we brought this legislation before. Last year it was killed in appropriations. So we met with the chair of appropriations, assembly member Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher, and she talked with us about why it didn't make it through appropriations. That was primarily because um, the governor, our former governor, was killing everything that had any kind of financial impact. Um, so we are going to be putting it up again. Senator, we met with Senator Bell, who's carrying the legislation. Uh, we also met with Senators Nielsen, Morlock, and Umberg, and uh, got some support. So we're hoping that we'll be able to make it through the legislature or the Senate this session and that it will be signed into law. Uh, we also took the time to meet with Jovan Aggie of uh, Treasurer Ma's staff, specifically on the issue of affordable housing and how we could bring more to our community. It was a very valuable trip, took two days, and we're hoping we'll see some very positive results. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Shea. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, last night I had the great privilege of representing the city at the Irvine Valley College. Um, they hosted the exhibit for Courage to Remember the Holocaust. And David, I see you down here in the front row. She and I went to Irvine Valley College together. And nice to see you here tonight. Um, it was really a very sobering but wonderful exhibit showcasing the Holocaust through photographs, over 200 photographs. Um, it's displaying uh, um, pictures and uh, depictions from 1933 to 1945. Um, we had two Holocaust survivors that attended the events, which really um, was a, a wonderful opportunity for all of us in the audience. Uh, we had council members, Anthony Quo attended with me, uh, Farrah Khan, and then also our Community Services uh, Commission Chair, um, Lauren Johnson Norris attended as well. So I think it goes on for at least two more days and I would really encourage all of you to go to Irvine Valley College and see the exhibit. It's, it's very outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. All right, a couple of announcements. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody who attended our first two community budget meetings last week. If you were unable to make it, there are two more opportunities to share your input on the city's budget. 
Upcoming meetings will be held Wednesday, March 13, from 6 to 7 p.m. at Quail Hill Community Center, and Wednesday, March 20, from 6 to 7 p.m. At, Porto at Portola Springs Community Center. No RSVP is needed. I hope you'll join us. For additional information on the city's budget process, please visit cityofirvine.org slash budget. <coughs> the Irvine Animal Care Center invites the community to support its foster donation drive that is taking place now through March 31. Support the center's puppies, kittens, and young rabbits, as well as recuperating animals by, doning, by donating supplies such as formula, blankets, and toys. View a complete wish list on the Irvine Animal Care Center's website, irvineanimals.org. In addition, anyone interested in volunteering with the center's foster care program, which provides shelter, supplies, food, and veterinary care for young animals or those recovering from medical procedures, can attend a foster volunteer workshop on Sunday, March 24, from 1.30 to 4. Register at yourirvine.org. For more information, visit irvineanimals.org or call 949-724-7498. The spring issue of Inside Irvine is in homes featuring stories on Great Park Ice, the city's affordable housing efforts, the city's transition to a two-year budget, and more. This edition also includes spring and summer camps and classes for all interests and ages. To register for camps and classes, visit yourirvine.org. <coughs> Excuse me again. All right, the uh, City Council will now consider the consent calendar, which uh, consists of items 3.1 and 3.4, and we will do that right after I ask the City Manager, are there additions or deletions to the agenda? There are no additions or deletions to the agenda this evening, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. All right, we're on to the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the City Manager to be routine, and all will be enacted by one roll call vote. There will be no discussion of these items unless members of the Council or the public request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion. Madam Clerk, any requests from the public to remove items? Yes, Mayor, item 3.2. All right, any requests from colleagues to remove an item? Mayor Pro Tem Shea. Okay, sorry, thank you, my fault. All right, I'll entertain a motion to approve the balance of the consent. Second. All right, uh, moved and seconded. Let's go ahead and vote. And the matter carries unanimously. Thank you all. Item 3.2. Um, I do have a request to speak from the public, and so this is an item to be read by the, ma uh, uh, the clerk. Commend Congregation Shirhamalati on its 50th anniversary. All right. Thank you, and I have a request to speak from Ilya Seglin. Good evening, Mayor Wagner and respectful Irvine City Council member. My name is Ilya Seglin. In agenda item 3.2, I would like to address Irvine City Council and congregation Shir Hamalot even if I'm not their member, but uh, their fellow, and uh, they have 50th anniversary. And let me relate <clears throat> Ellie Weasel, one of the most Holocaust uh, known survivor and a writer. Whenever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religious, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. And that's why I'm here, and this is a center of the universe, because you know well, I'm coming for seven years, and my family, especially my son, persecuted. Um, here, today, not my son, Robert, but I'm glad that Michael Klubnikin, a special person, is here 
And I would like to, um, to tell that my son, Nate, was abducted, tortured, and has been exterminated on the basis of false report fabricated by director of Orange County Regional Center, Larry Landauer. Larry Landauer is not only predator, he is profiteering and disabled. Um, the congregation Shir Hamalot knows the Torah values as persecute, pursuing justice and they know what is mitzvah. So I want at the end uh, my speech repeat again the word of uh, Ellie Wiesel. Whenever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let me just, uh, normally this is on consent calendar, but since it has been pulled off, and thank you, uh, Mr. Seglin, uh, for those comments. Uh, just, just briefly, um, a part of the commendation, uh, whereas uh, Congregation Shir Hamalat serves over 600 families, and provides a variety of programs, including religious school, youth programs, family connections, social action programs, adult learning, community programs, and special events. Whereas Congregation Shiram Alat will celebrate its anniversary with a Friday evening Shabbat service on March 15, 2019, followed by its annual spring gala on March 16, 2019, with the theme 50 Magical Years at its Pearly Family Campus which opened in June of 2018. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Irvine does hereby commend and congratulate Congregation Shir Hamalat on its 50th anniversary. That is uh, the gist of the uh, commendation, and I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Um, assembly member, uh, whoever no, you no. are. Mr. No, Wall. no, no. No? Yes. Go. Floor is yours. Oh, I was going to move the item, but All right. that's fine. Items that moved and seconded, let's vote on the item. <clears throat> We voted? Yes, motion carried unanimously. I, I'm not seeing any, all right, there it is. Motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you very much. <coughs> all right, we are at item 4.1. Madam Clerk, if you would read. Review of enforcement strategy for boarding houses and short-term rentals and code amendment to clarify the definition of boarding house. Thank you. Let, uh, let me turn it over to staff to identify yourselves and, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, we have a public hearing to go, to, to go through with this one, but uh, identify yourselves and go ahead and give us the report. Good evening, Mayor Wagner and council members. My name is Steve Holtz and I'm the Neighborhood Services Manager in the Community Development Department. <coughs> with me is Pete Carmichael, Director of Community Development. And joining us are Code Enforcement Supervisor Cassie Palmer and Noam Duesman, Legal Counsel from Rattan and Tucker. We are here this evening in response to increasing resident complaints and concerns regarding both short-term rentals and boarding houses. Staff has developed a proactive strategy for identifying and addressing short-term rental violations and proposed code update to assist with the enforcement of unpermitted boarding houses. The terms short-term rental and boarding house are sometimes misunderstood because in some ways they can be similar, but there are key differences that influence how they are investigated and enforced by code enforcement staff. Short-term rentals are homes that are rented for less than 31 days, typically for vacation or business travelers. This type of rental can be for an entire home, a single room, or a bed. And because these properties are generally considered businesses similar to a hotel, they are prohibited in Irvine in all residential zones. Boarding houses are homes with multiple tenants on separate leases, renting separate rooms, and only the, common area, only the common areas of the home, such as the kitchen, are accessible to all tenants. 
Boarding house complaints are commonly for non-owner occupied investment properties where every bedroom is rented as a separate unit. And sometimes the living room, dining room, and garage have been converted into bedrooms, turning, for example, a three bedroom house into a six bedroom boarding house. In keeping with the intention of the city's master plan villages, this type of housing is allowed only under a conditional use permit, which would ensure that there is sufficient on-site parking and that other basic conditions are met before a permit is issued. To be clear, boarding houses do not include roommates living together under a single lease, student housing facilities, or housing facilities licensed by the state or county. Staff has seen a significant increase in complaints, particularly related to short-term rentals in recent years. We believe this is due largely to the growing sharing economy and the popularity of online platforms such as Airbnb and VRBO. As the number of complaints has grown, short-term rental cases have become increasingly challenging for code enforcement staff to investigate. Online platforms have eliminated addresses from advertisements and many operators disguise property locations in their advertisements and use multiple online identities, making it difficult and resource intensive for code enforcement to gather evidence of a violation. To illustrate, in 2018, short-term rentals accounted for 10% of code enforcement's total caseload, but required 25% of our staffing resources, or the equivalent of one full-time inspector. Complaints we receive about short-term rentals are similar to complaints about boarding houses and typically concern changes to neighborhood character, traffic, parking, trash, public disturbance, and safety. And as with most code enforcement cases, these are investigated and enforced through a reactive or complaint-based approach. This means that a complaint must be received before code enforcement investigates a potential violation. The consequence of this approach is that some violations go unaddressed due to lack of a complaint, leading to a perception that enforcement is arbitrary or that unaddressed violations are acceptable to the city. Staff has identified a strategy to address short-term rentals and is recommending a code amendment to assist in enforcement of unpermitted boarding houses. First, we are proposing to transition code enforcement to a more proactive approach for enforcement of short-term rentals. Residents will still be encouraged to report suspected violations, but under this new approach, staff will not require a complaint to take action on a potential violation. As always, code enforcement takes an education-first approach and uses its enforcement tools, such as citations, as a last resort. Our second strategy is to take advantage of new technologies that have emerged as a result of the rapid growth of the short-term rental industry. We recently engaged the services of a third-party vendor called Host Compliance with the technological capacity to monitor the internet for these properties. In their preliminary assessment of online listings, Host Compliance estimates that there are approximately 1,300 active short-term rentals in Irvine. Starting in about a month, the firm will begin sending notification letters which city staff prepared in coordination with the city attorney's office to the operators of these properties, informing them that short-term rentals are not allowed in Irvine. Through an incremental approach, we estimate it will take six to eight months to make contact with the operators of all 1,300 properties. After three attempts to obtain voluntary compliance, we will begin issuing citations to those that refuse to comply. We believe this service provided by host compliance will significantly improve short-term rental investigations and allow code enforcement resources to be redirected to other city priorities. Additionally, staff is recommending an update to the city's definition of boarding houses in the zoning ordinance. As shown here, Boarding houses are currently defined as residences where there are two or more rental agreements. Under this standard, code enforcement must obtain copies of lease documents to prove a violation. And in many instances, landlords are refusing to provide copies of their lease documents, 
making it very difficult to enforce. For these reasons, we are proposing a revision to the boarding house definition, adding a requirement that households be a single housekeeping unit. If approved, this would require that all residents of a property jointly occupy and have equal access to the property, meaning rooms cannot be separately rented. This would also require that all residents act as the functional equivalent of a family, where they may share living expenses, chores, eat meals together, and are a close group with social, economic, and psychological commitments to each other. This simply means there must be a relationship among the occupants beyond the fact that they live together. Shown here is a summary of the proposed amendment. The full text is available as attachment two to the staff report. When code enforcement officers are investigating suspected unpermitted boarding houses, they're usually able to make contact with the occupants. Based on their training and experience, they engage the individuals, ask questions, and if granted permission, inspect the property. Through these investigations, staff is usually able to determine if the residents would meet this single housekeeping unit requirement. It is far easier to obtain this information through conversation, so a complaint can be addressed without having to obtain lease documents. Oftentimes, investigators observe that boarding house tenants know very little about each other. Sometimes they don't even know each other's names. The proposed single housekeeping unit requirement is meant to apply to these types of situations, not friends, classmates, coworkers, unmarried couples, or any other type of common relationship that people have when they live together. In instances when a violation is confirmed, code enforcement staff makes every effort to assist tenants being displaced. This means working with property owners and tenants to provide a reasonable time frame for affected residents to find alternative housing. Code enforcement will also help property owners understand how to apply for a conditional use permit to legalize the boarding house if they would like to pursue that option. We've recently updated our information online to make it easier for the public to find and understand the rules related to short-term rentals and boarding houses. The city's main webpage, shown on the left, and the Community Development Department and Code Enforcement webpages now have multiple links to information on short-term rentals and boarding houses, with a quick link for residents to report a suspected violation. Increasing complaints related to congested on-street parking can be partly attributed to the proliferation of short-term rentals and unpermitted boarding houses. However, overcrowded on-street parking can also be attributed to the preference of many residents to park on the street and use their garage for other purposes. Staff has reviewed this concern and identified two potential solutions. These include an overnight parking ban, which could be imposed in targeted neighborhoods, or parking permits, which could limit on-street parking with city-issued permits. Staff is seeking feedback from the City Council on these potential measures to address on-street parking concerns. If so directed, staff will work to identify a recommendation for future City Council consideration, including regulations that would allow for parking enforcement on privately owned streets. Staff is seeking feedback from the City Council on the proposed strategy for addressing short-term rentals and on-street parking issues. And finally, staff recommends introducing for first reading this evening the proposed zoning ordinance amendment modifying the city's definition of boarding houses to add the single housekeeping unit requirement, which we believe would make code enforcement investigations more effect effective. That concludes staff's presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And before we um, get to the public hearing, we've been getting a lot of uh, mail, emails, and other correspondence. One of the recurring themes from some folks who object to this, and I throw it out for you, uh, and maybe it's for our uh, attorney, and so maybe it won't get addressed this evening if we answer it up front, if, if there's a good answer, is the argument that the um, uh, law prohibits in housing uh, discrimination against or based upon familial status. 
um, what is the scope of that prohibition and how, if any, do we address it in this proposed ordinance? Thanks, Mayor. I'll, I'll take my uh, first shot at Thank that. You, there. Thanks. But <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, it comes from two angles. First, um, under the fair housing law, there are specific statutory prohibitions against discrimination based upon familial status. However, those provisions don't apply in circumstances when the local agency is advancing a legitimate government interest. And the government interests were highlighted in the staff report in this case, but they, they effectively amount to preserving the residential character of the neighborhood. There were other issues mm -hmm. relating to noise and other types of complaints, but fundamentally the neighborhood character. So we've looked at that issue and are comfortable um, that this ordinance is within the ambit of the fair housing law. The other issue had to do with discrimination based on familial status, more at a kind of a constitutional right to privacy level. Um, and there was a case recently coming out of Santa, Santa Barbara um, that addressed that. And it turns out that we, were, we are using the holding in that case from the California Supreme Court as the basis for redirecting or adding the focus onto this single housekeeping unit concept. That's a specific concept that was specifically endorsed by the California Supreme Court, cross-referring to cases coming out of New Jersey that use that concept. Um, and so we have actually attempted to hew very closely to the law as it exists to ensure that we're compliant. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we need to do a public hearing, so I will now declare open a public hearing on item 4.1. And um, Madam Clerk, have you received any requests from members of the public to speak? Yes, Indeed Mayor. you have. I have a list that is quite long here. Um, all right, so we'll take them. I'll take them in the order that they have been received. Uh, the list is quite long in deference to other speakers. Um, if you could try not to repeat what's been said uh, before would be uh, greatly appreciated. We will start with David Gregory, followed by Mario Lopez. So, oh, Davida, excuse me, it is indeed. Davida Gregory, followed by Mario Lopez, and as I call your name, come on down, the first speaker, and then just the others kind of get ready so we're not waiting too long. Ms. Gregory. Hi. I am first. All right. And this is my first speech. Bear with me. Um, I've lived in Irvine since about 1972 and at my current residence for 41 years. During those 41 plus years, I've been renting rooms. Yes, I'm one of those people. Um, and I want you to take into account that during those 40 years, I haven't had a complaint. There is a need for what used to be called boarding houses. Now they're called short-term rentals. Sometimes they're called homestay. And there needs to be a distinguishment between rooms that one rents in one's home while we're in residence and those people who rent homes when they're away. I don't want to live next to a hotel type residence and I certainly don't want to live next door to Party Central. And complaint, you're right, complaint-based enforcement is inherently unjust. Currently, um, we're subjected to coercion and blackmail. And what's been going on is horrible. In my case, I was threatened and called anti-Semitic names by somebody who tried to obtain my property. And when I didn't, um, they did call code enforcement. There was not a complaint for 40 years. And there is a need or short-term rentals wouldn't exist. I have people coming from overseas, people coming from, uh, coming to UCI. I had the principal of one of our high schools who stayed with me during a time when he was waiting for escrow to close. I've had people come stay with me when they've had their houses fumigated. And I've had people who were homeless 
and couldn't afford first and last month's rent come stay with me on a short-term basis and renewed and renewed and renewed. No complaints for 40 years. I guess that's about it. Um, I think that if there wasn't a need, short-term rentals wouldn't exist. There needs to be an avenue where we can be licensed legally and continue to provide the service to Irvine and to our community and our country. Blanketly stopping us is just so, so wrong. Thank, thank you, Ms. Gregory. Lopez is is next and um, quick quick housekeeping detail three minutes but you don't have to take it all mr. Lopez thank you mr. mayor uh, good evening council um, I will not take the full three minutes I promise uh, my name is Mario Lopez with Irvine Association Services I am an HOA manager um, for Princeton townhomes 286 condominium association about a half a mile from UCI uh, I just wanted, I'm just here today to uh, share some of the ways our community has been affected uh, by these boarding house um, um, type of units in the past few years. Um, number one, currently about 30% of all rentals, um, properties in the complex can be considered a boarding house um, per the, the new definition being considered. Um, this, trend, this trend has really increased uh, more and more each year as we have also found families are starting to move out of the community recently. Um, we don't really know why, we can just assume that it has something to do with this. Um, we have, as previously mentioned, we have found living rooms, garages, and dining rooms that are being converted into temporary bedrooms. Um, they use curtains to divide each space as kind of a temporary wall. Um, the parking associated with, these, with this has also been challenging to enforce our parking rules as the additional tenants and cars have forced us to increase our security budget for the year. Which, evidently, which eventually ended up increasing the dues for each of the owners um, for this fiscal year. Um, these units have also been found not to be properly maintained. Um, this includes unmaintained patios, um, examples as bed sheets being used as curtains, and just habitual violations of the community rules that every new turnover of tenants um, ends up leading to. Um, doo -doo, noise nuisances, late night gatherings, trash, including trash found along the common area and overfilled trash bins due to the high occupancy are all additional issues we feel has really increased more and more. And um, it's really changed, the, as previously mentioned, the neighborhood character um, as more of a family neighborhood to just more of a rental than just temporary housing. So please take all this into consideration when discussing the boarding house definition tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We've got Sherry Avila followed by Mahmoud Alfara. Hi. Um. Thank you for hearing us tonight. Um, I would like to address a few issues. I have real concerns with the ordinance. I am concerned that the process of, that the process of investigation is very opaque to the person being investigated. I'm worried about um, civil rights of rather than going to the party benefiting the landlord, that it's gonna be people interviewed, people that live there, and that they might not know their rights and how to you know, maintain that they will have a home. Um, and I would like to know what has happened in the past to the people that have been, um, who have been turned out of these boarding houses. Then I also want to speak to um, the AARP, as the young, <laughs> as was as spoken, many older women are by themselves, and they outlive their husbands and their retirement, and they really depend on having other people in their homes to help them pay their bills. So um, I want to, <laughs> I just want to make sure that civil rights are protected, that older people are protected, that young people that move into our community are protected. I'm very concerned that the uh, questioning is a psychological determination. I mean, who has to, how do you go into someone's home and tell them, you know, let, let's see, it, determine if you are really a unit or not. It just seems incredibly invasive. So, um, and then also I would like to speak against controlled parking 
if there's a problem, I think we can work with our HOA. I definitely don't want to have to have my garage inspected. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Alfara. And again, if you could come down as your name's called so you're ready to go, uh, Mr. Alfara, followed by Cassius Rutherford. Hello, honorable members of the Irvine City Council and honorable Mr. Mayor. My name is Mahmoud Alfara. I'm a resident in Orange County and a student at Saddleback College. I'm here to speak in opposition of agenda item 4.1, which would increase enforcement and restrictions of boarding housings. I believe that if, if this agenda item gets confirmed, the problem of homelessness will only worsen. Many individuals who overcrowd are students. There are over 1,300 housing and food insecure students at Saddleback College, and that number continues to rise, and that also continues to rise across the entire county. This is because housing costs too much in Orange County. Not only that, but there are many other variables in place, such as stagnant wages and housing, co housing costs of tuition. Excuse me. All of this makes it harder not just for students, but all families with different ages and backgrounds who can barely afford to house themselves. The people of this city and county deserve decency. Sharing apartments and splitting rent is a common practice in a way where many people in the city are able to have a roof over their head and not to have to sleep in their cars and on the streets. Housing is extremely important to maintaining a decent quality of life and the ability for people to be productive members of our society. People who have housing can worry more about their work and bettering themselves than having to worry about where they are going to sleep the next day. Homelessness has a detrimental effect on a person's motivation to work. It makes a person feel as if they are less than human. I think it is the duty of this city council to allow people to keep a roof over their head by the means of share housing and rent splitting so that they can have a decency and continue to, product, to be productive members of our society. And I'm speaking to the public chamber as of right now, uh, to all the citizens and people in here who are opposed to Agenda 4.1, if you have the junction and the physical stature to at least stand up to show your support or opposition against 4.1. As you can see behind me, there are multiple people who are your constituents, who are students who are against Agenda Item 4.1. We are all urging all the members of this Irvine City Council to amend agenda item 4.1 and remove boarding houses from the ordinance for the decency and fairness that we as individuals deserve. I hope you oppose this too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Cassius, uh, Mr. Alfara Cassius Rutherford, followed by Mark Richard Daniels. It's not written out here. Mark Richard, come on down. Good evening, Mayor Wagner, honorable council members. Thank you for your time this evening. I'm the chief of staff for the Associated Students of UC Irvine Office of the President. And you can see there are many of us here tonight. We're really concerned about this ordinance, not just this ordinance though, you know me, my issue is housing. My issue is our generation's access to housing in this county and in this state. And we're in a housing crisis. We're in a severe housing shortage in this county. And so that's the context for this and us seeing this issue come before us. So I wanna get into how this impacts us specifically. When you're going to regulate the definition of occupancy to a quote unquote equivalent, functional equivalent of a family. And it sounds like the interaction that just um, went on between the mayor and the city attorney was that you looked at case president and found the, the just right way you could tweak this law so that you're not violating the Fair Housing Act, but so that the city can still ramp up its code enforcement. That's something I'm really concerned about because when we're reading this, the language of this ordinance itself, a lot of us have done a close reading of it. It kind of seems like it could be a violation of the Fair Housing Act and discriminating on the basis of fami familial, um, uh, familial, uh, arrangements. Um, so we're really opposed to this. We're really opposed to this item within this ordinance. I mean, there are some good elements of this ordinance, like the regulation on Airbnbs and short-term rentals, right? Like I said, I'm all about housing. So if we can free up more housing for residents and you regulate those kind of land uses, that's totally fine if the city wants to do that. But if you want to come in, and I really don't think it's the role of this council to come in and police and regulate who I can live with, who I can rent with, what kind of living situations that I can go about in my daily lives, because that's what this is about. Our generation is struggling in this economy. 
The kind of people that this will impact are not the financially successful homeowners. They're not the people making six figures. These are the people that are struggling to get by and they rent rooms in homes because that's the cheapest option. That's how I live. We have our garage turned into a master bedroom. It's the only way we can afford to live in this county. And we're good neighbors. We grow avocados for our neighbors. You could share avocado toast with me if you live next to me. Um, so this is really important to us in preserving our access, our generation's access to this economy. And this way of housing is key to that. Um, there's some data that we included in the letter that we sent you, just giving you an idea of the segment of the student body that this will impact. I mean, Isaac Morales is a grad student here tonight. He'll be speaking as well. But our research shows that 30% of the UCI student body lives in serious conditions of overcrowding. This is not a small number of students we're talking about. This is not a small population that you're gonna impact. This is a vast segment of our student body. I mean, think about that. 30% of you know, 33,000 undergrad students. Um, I wanna quickly address the claim that we're not working with UCI or UCI is not doing enough for housing. We are lobbying UCI to make a strong commitment to on-campus housing. They've already made the strongest commitment of any UC in the state. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Richard Daniels, followed by David, and then Joshua. So David and then Joshua after Mark. David and Joshua, it sounds like a Bible. Uh, thank you, Donald Wagner. Um, my name is Mark Richard Daniels. I wanted to come to you to um, point out the fact that, you know, let's stop and think that we are uh, in a, a, a city, a great city that has... Uh, a great university and relies on student housing and those that can't afford housing need maybe a boarding place. We, we have to take into account that um, we are in a county and a state and a country that is very um, much in crisis with the homeless situation and there has to be more access to places to live. And I do believe that um, to basically, I understand you have to word things a certain way and you have to uh, be diligent in your efforts to keep your city um, solid, not be taken over by um, various um, overcrowding and all that. But I'm looking at that seal up there and I think, uh, well, that represents a family on one side and I'm not sure which direction they're looking, but they look like they're all kind of got each other's back kind of thing. Then I'm realizing that, um, you know, given the fact that the economy the way it is, that that family right there could be living under the tree on the other side of the seal. And so I think at the same time, you're going to have to um, realize that we're in, a, in such a great crisis in this country, in this great rich country of ours, that if we don't get this right, all of us, and it's the Irvine Council, it's the Anaheim Council, it's all the councils and all the people, if we don't get this homeless situation right, then we have failed as a, as a society. And it's gonna be 100 years from now, people will look back and say, how did they get this, this crisis? How did they deal with this um, most egregious situation and here we have a plentiful city in a plentiful county in a plentiful state and country and we have people living out on the streets so we have to give every opportunity for people to live in um, in a safe environment and I understand the whole parking thing is another issue too but let's uh, stop and think before we uh, completely throw out the whole uh, concept of helping after we just heard from Paul Leone in this, uh, you know, feel good video that we just saw. And then we're just going to turn people out to the street. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, followed by Joshua. Are you David? Sure. David's not here. Well, we'll move to Joshua, followed by Jeff Davis. Uh, greetings, Council and Mayor. My name is R. Joshua Collins. I'm the founder of Homeless Advocates for Christ. 
And uh, first and foremost, just want to encourage everyone to give the life to Jesus Christ, who died for us. We've all sinned. We all need the Savior to save us from the wrath to come. And by God's grace, through Christ, we can be saved. Um, now, we know Jesus was homeless himself. He had a big heart for the poor and the needy. He lived among the poor and the needy in his ministry. I think it's important that this council and this mayor get in touch with the poor and the needy. You know, the, it, it's clear to me, I mean, if the city of Irvine is getting sued for, you know, not providing what is needed for the homeless, that maybe the city of Irvine has become insensitive to the poor and the needy. And when you hear these students, you know, and they're, they're uh, crying out, you know, for, for protection, for housing, I think you really need to listen. You know, it's, uh, it's stressful to be homeless. Um, I've, for part of my ministry, lived with the homeless, and so I experienced it firsthand. And I'm an ex-mathematics instructor. I got a college education. I graduated with honors. But um, if I had to struggle with housing so much as in this society today, maybe it would have been a different situation. I don't know. But uh, we can't take... Uh, uh, you know, these, these students' lives and just, just play with them. You know, it's, it's um, we need to create more affordable housing. Uh, we need to create a powerful safety net for people that need housing. And until that safety net is created, I don't think you should do anything to shake up anybody's housing situation. So when you look at this, you know, the, the, the students are concerned. We have the Housing Security Commissioner from uh, ASUCI, the President's Chief of Staff, <coughs> external vice president and president for the ASUCI, all signing this letter, uh, concerned about the criminalization and the sharing of residential living spaces. I mean, I don't think it's for nothing that they've signed this letter. I think it's important to, to, to pay attention to them and, and um, you know, to much is given, much is required. I look at the city of Irvine, I look at the, the uh, Taj Mahal of city halls here. I've spoken at many, but this is pretty, pretty elaborate here. Uh, you must have enough to help these people and don't ignore their cries. Uh, Proverbs 21, 13 tells us those that ignore the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be heard. So I believe that's a serious warning from the Lord, and, and we should all pay heed to that. Uh, of course, there's many other similar warnings. And uh, we know that homelessness has increased 60% since 2017. So uh, I think possibly when you, you know, if you were to change and, 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 and uh, pass this, it might make it worse. So uh, thanks for your time, and I hope you do the right thing. Thank you. Jeff Davis, followed by Ashley Alvarez. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm Jeff Davis here this evening on behalf of the Irvine Company. And um, my actually, my question is one of a bit of clarification. I think I know the answer. Mr. Holt uh, addressed it in his presentation. But as the council is aware, um, we've had been in long discussions with the city, and the Irvine Company has, in fact, on file with the city of Irvine a student housing development that's designed specifically for um, the university residents, uh, particularly with the UCI students. It's on a property that's immediately adjacent to UCI. In fact, most people would think that the site is actually on campus if you were to drive by it. And so my question to the, to the council here and to the staff is, does that definition, will that definition apply to um, the student housing program that we have because we do intend to lease or rent on a per room basis with that program. It seems that it might be in a bit of a conf conflict, but our understanding is that we'll be able to work through that with the city in that process, and that's really what the question I have uh, for the team this evening. And again, I'd be here to answer any questions the council might have with regard to that project. It's a ways away. We'll probably be back before, hopefully, the city uh, by the end of this year through the public hearing process. A little bit premature to get into those details, but did want to get that clarification this evening if possible. Do we have a clarification either from staff or council? We do, Mr. Mayor. That project would, as designated, um, as dedicated student housing, would be exempted from the boarding house regulation. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Ashley Alvarez, please people come on down. I gotta start the clock when your name gets called if, if you're not ready. Follow by Teresa Loveless. Well, hello, my name is Ashley Alvarez and I am a student at UC Irvine here to speak in opposition of item 4.1. My question is, without this service, where do you propose students are going to live? 
Um, this living circumstance is the way it is because housing is unaffordable. This is a growing university. Student numbers are only going to increase and they're going to need a place to live. So item 4.1 isn't going to stop students from living near the university they attend. All it's going to do is put further strain on students who will live in cars, tents, if need be. And that's particularly dangerous. Um, to criminalize the common practice of room sharing is disheartening to students who are giving everything they have to pursue a higher education. As a student, ha as a student having to fight for a safe place to sleep and to live is dehumanizing. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. Teresa Lovelace. <laughs> Zajian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, my name is Teresa Lovelace. I'm an Irvine resident and biomedical researcher. Um, when talking to potential colleagues, the cost of living is one of their major concerns when considering coming here. And many of them who do come here make it work financially by living with roommates. And I worry if shared housing were not an option, it would be much harder for uh, me to help recruit future colleagues. And on a personal note, um, I'm a mother of young children who lives right by UCI. And I think that students who live in shared housing really contribute to the uh, vibrant community that I love and why I'm happy to raise my children here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Abizajian, followed by Hoan Vo. Not seeing Mr. Abizajian. Uh, Hoan Vo, followed by Annie Lee. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members. Thank you for having us. Um, I am here in support of item 4.1. I want to thank the staff for all their hard work on this. Um, as Mr. Holtz already made clear, and I will reiterate, Short-term rentals have always been against Irvine policy. Irvine's policy has never allowed short-term rentals. Irvine's code has always required boarding houses to be conditionally permitted. It does not prohibit boarding houses. It regulates them, and it requires that they go through various checks to ensure that they meet the Irvine's overall plans. We've heard tonight quite a few of the speakers with some very serious concerns, legitimate concerns, I'll give that, um, about affordable housing. Tonight is not about affordable housing. As Irvine has already stated its policies, it's already embedded in the code, tonight is about en enabling your staff to enforce Irvine's policies and codes. My wife and I chose to move to Irvine. We chose to purchase in Irvine and we chose to establish our roots in Irvine because of the quality of life and the unique quality of life Irvine provides and the fact that Irvine adheres to its master plan. What we are hearing tonight is to ignore all of that, to address larger social problems. Ignoring that, ignoring Irvine's codes will not solve that. We have, my wife and I, as well as our neighbors, have experienced short-term rentals and boarding houses and the detrimental effect of them on our neighborhoods right in front of our faces. Increased trash, increased traffic, strangers through the night. Every example Mr. Holtz listed, we experienced, and we saw it day in and day out, and it took significant city resources, including the city attorney's resources, to put a stop to this. The proposal to, to allow better enforcement is a better proposal. It, I support that. On April 24th of last year, this city council approved code updates, including revisions to the boarding house and short-term rental rules to reinforce the stated policy against short-term rentals and to require conditional use permitting of boarding houses. It was unanimously approved by this council, excluding the new members, Quo and Khan. Welcome. Um, so that was a step in the right direction. Tonight is another step in that same direction. I encourage the, the council to approve this item. Thank you. All right, thank you. Annie Lee, followed by Jeannie Lee. Good evening. I am Annie a third year undergraduate majoring in criminology law at the University of California, Irvine. I am also its student body president. On behalf of the undergraduate student body at the University of California, Irvine, the associate students of UC Irvine Office of the President stand in strong opposition 
to the city council proposed include in agenda item 4.1 to ramp up the code enforcement and restrictions on boarding house. Currently defined as residents with multiple tenants on multiple leases, the proposed code clarifications of boarding house adds a requirement uh, that household in the city of Irvine be a single housing housekeeping unit defined as the functional equivalence of a family. This proposed change to the city code and the hiring of a subcontractors to help increase enforcement would effectively criminalize the common practice of house adding housemate and roommates to reduce the burden of high living costs. ASUCI strongly opposes this attempt to regulate, restrict, and criminalize the sharing of residential living space. New research by ASUCI with a survey of over 2,000 UCI students in 2018 reveals that 30% of UCI students report conditions of serious overcrowding in their, in their living spaces, defined as over two residents per bedroom and or more than one resident living in common spaces, such as a living room. Considering that less than 48% of the UCI student body lives on campus, this is the, still the highest percentage of students housed on any campus that, of the UC. The proposal in agenda item 4.1 could have negative detrimental impact on many UCI students who make their home in the greater Irvine. It would also severely restrict on the freedom of property owners and landlords looking to add housemates or boarders, particularly UCI students. The housing crisis in Orange County affects families of all ages and backgrounds, hitting the most vulnerable first. Students and young professionals who reduce their living expenses by sharing a resident should not be fined and criminalized for engaging in this common practice. If parking is an issue, in certain areas, the Irvine City Council could easily implement uh, permit parking in affected neighborhoods, not regulate and restrict the living arrangement of student and young professional. ASUCI urges you to amend agenda item 4.1 and remove the harsh code enforcement changes to board houses, boarding houses from the ordinance. Thank you for your time listening to my concerns. And I would also like to thank the students who are here today. It's finals exams week, and we are here speaking about what um, we hold close to our heart. Thank you for your thank, time. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Jeannie Lee. <laughs> followed by Jacobus Coes. Um, good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Jeannie Lee. I'm also a student at UC Irvine. And my first question here is, who actually wants to live in a garage or a living room or a kitchen. Um, no one wants to do that. No one wants to share a room with two, three other people. This is something that we have to do in order to attain affordable housing. Um, and I understand that um, people are telling us that this is not an attack on students. You aren't directly saying this, but this is an attack on students. We are the ones who are taking short-term leases. We are the ones who are adding multiple leases to a homes. We are the ones living in living rooms and garage spaces because we have no other places to go. At the beginning of the school year, I was offered an apartment near UCI. It was $3,000 for a two-bedroom, one-bathroom apartment. I was able to find another apartment. It was about $300 less, but it was still extremely expensive. It only allowed two parking permits, and this meant that we had three other students who had to commute to school, but didn't have the parking permits to have their cars there. Now I'm living in a home. Um, I was very fortunate to be able to find a home <coughs> in Irvine, except now we have six students who are trying to commute. We don't want to drive 20 minutes every day to get to school, but this is what we have to do. And now, including this parking ban on us would regulate how we are parking on our streets. There are six students to one home, and if you're only allowing us the garage in our two spaces, we don't have enough parking. I have friends who come over. I offer to all my friends, if you need a place to stay, if you need food, you can come over any time. And these people often stay overnight. These people often don't have other places to go. I think that a problem here we have is pretending that Irvine is all families and that half of Irvine isn't students. <laughs> I have friends who live in apartments. It's $3,100 for their two-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment. 
and there's three people to a room. Um, they're saying that they're limiting this to a functional equi equivalent of a family. At the beginning of the school year, when I found my apartment, I did not live with anyone I knew. I went online, I found random people. I didn't care as long as I had roommates, as long as I had housemates, because I couldn't afford anything else except for that one apartment at the time. So we were not the functional equivalent of a family. We were nowhere near that. We didn't have classes together. We had nothing in common besides the fact that we went to UC Irvine, and one of the students who ended up living with us ended up not going to UC Irvine and going to school online, and I never even saw her. We lived perfectly fine. We're there now, and I would just like to say that I'm in complete opposition of this entire proposal and in, in amending the definition of boarding homes as well as the parking ban and permit system. Thank you. Thank you. Jacobus Coase, followed by Elizabeth Donaldson. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Jacobus Coase. I'm a third year at, at UCI and an intern for the Student Bodies Housing Security Commission on campus. As a rep representative of students, young people, and the disenfranchised, my colleagues and I are incredibly saddened by the proposed ordinance towards boarding houses in the greater Irvine area. It is no secret that many of the living situations and students of UCI and other institutions require housemates and sharing facilities to make ends meet. Young people are already endeavored with exorbitant tuition prices and cost of living. Sharing housing just to make rent is our means to survive. While those other endeavors in life are our own cross to bear, we're, we take pride in doing it. We should not be punished for alternative solutions to housing, but encouraged to con continue thriving. Crowding parking and noise complaints are not sufficient reasons to place a human spirit. Students, young people, and all those living in, in the boarding houses are an integral part of the identity of Irvine. I'm afraid that if we wage a war on the future of Irvine, that, that the, um, I'm afraid if we implement this war on the, on the young people of Irvine, that they will not come and they will not have the opportunity to make themselves better. As someone that comes from a small farm town outside of Fresno with a population of 1,100 people, I was one of four people out of my entire graduating class to come to college. And I came to Irvine because it offered me a place for prosperity and to better myself. And I feel that if those other people don't have the opportunity to do that, I'd be incredibly saddened and Irvine would lose its identity. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Ms. Co Mr. Coase, Elizabeth Donaldson, followed by Jane Ollinger. Honored Council, thank you for opening this up to comments this evening. Um, I am not from here originally. I moved here to attend UC Irvine where I'm a fifth year senior. Um, and I'm finding that Irvine is a very interesting place. For instance, this council meeting itself, earlier this evening you saw a presentation on homelessness and how it is skyrocketing. And yet you are also listening to this proposal which would surely lead to a greater increase in homelessness, especially student homelessness. And I can't help but think that the very residents who have made these complaints would then in turn make more complaints about homelessness and probably would then leave the city of Irvine itself after a while. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm used to this paradoxical nature of this strange city, for instance, you know, again, with this proposal, even though Irvine itself is so deeply red, we have a very clear violation of what are Republican conservative values. We have limitations on free commerce, the free association. We have the intrusion of the government on the doings of private persons and private companies and how they choose to associate, uh, form their leases, et cetera. Um, but perhaps it's a waste of time to speak of values. Perhaps I should instead be speaking of value itself. I should be speaking about Irvine's economy. It stands to reason that if you limit the amount of people who live within the city, then you will also limit the customer base of Irvine and of Irvine's businesses. And in doing so, you will then damage the businesses. I mean, maybe we should just go ahead and take a wrecking ball to UTC if if this goes through, and perhaps some people would like that, but I doubt that large corporations such as Trader Joe's, Target, et cetera, would, would appreciate that. You also heard a present... Continue. You also heard a presentation on reputation, and I think that that's certainly something to take into account as well, the city of Irvine's reputation. Not only did we hear a presentation on the work of, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch her name, but the work that she and her colleagues have done to increase the reputation and visibility of Irvine, but also UCI was recently voted 
the number one dream school. We are at a very crucial point, I think, for the city to show just to show its good side, to show how great it can be. Um, and the school itself, I might also like to point out, received an unprecedented amount of applications in recent years, and that probably will, will increase. If word gets out that Irvine is actually not so friendly to incoming students, and it will, because my generation is marked by communication, social media use, it could be, it won't be ideal. So, and I am out of time, but thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Donaldson. Jane Ollinger, <clears throat> followed by Susan Sayer. I want to uh, speak to the last speaker. They don't get much bluer than me, and I think you council people know it. But I'm here tonight to thank Council Member Coe for bringing this issue uh, to the fore here. Um, I'm here tonight also to support the Irvine city staff concerning boarding houses. The state has preempted the regulation of the number of persons allowed to live in a residence in the city, but excuse me, city laws can be very effective in mitigating problems. On my own street, there are seven homes total. One of the three bedroom homes generates 10 cars, up to 10 cars per day, one three-bedroom home. The garage contains sofas, audio equipment, noise, trash in the yard, and rats are also generated. The same situation can be seen and, and experienced throughout the city, and I think that's what the staff was saying. This issue has nothing to do with homelessness at all. The problems as, as I see it, and there are many, um, Regulations, parking regulations, are not strict enough in Irvine generally. Regulations are strict and enforced in some HOAs and not in others. This, our, our HOA is very, very old. It was, this problem was never envisioned at that time. The city has allowed increased building density, narrower streets, and less parking allowances. When an area has a high non-owner occupancy rate, lenders will not provide prime fin uh, financing. I've been a realtor for 38 years now. Someone was here from Princeton, and they're what, up to 30% now, I think he said? You start hitting, getting up to 40, and look out. Those homeowners are not going to get, or their buyers are not going to get prime financing. HUD prohibits it. Um, housing is expensive, and UCI students need housing, but, but is the problem for the uni that, that is a problem for the University of California, not the residents of Irvine, whose home is probably their single most important inv investment. I know that. Residents pay their mortgages, homeowner association dues, upkeep, and should be able to enjoy their homes. And here are three, well, three packets, but in here are six disclosures that we have to make as realtors. And every homeowner has to make, really. These go to them. And they're going to have to disclose if there is anything in their neighborhood that could affect the, their use and enjoyment. Those are the exact words that are used in the law, use and enjoyment of the property. And a, are you telling me my board your, 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 your time is up, okay. if you could wrap up. I think you get the point. Thank you, Susan Sayer, followed by Isaac Morales. Yes, good evening. Um, my name is Susan Sayer, and I've lived in Irvine for decades. I'm not going to repeat what a lot of people have said, uh, so I'm going to cut mine a little shorter. The a part that I have a problem with with this ordinance is the parking um, uh, uh, regulations. Um, I, I really don't like the proposed overnight street parking restriction from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. I live in a condo, in a large a condo complex, with one, two, and three bedroom condos. We, there are no garages. We have one carport for each of the condos. 
my family, I live in a two-bedroom condo. We have two cars. Uh, there's a family across from me in a two-bedroom unit. There's four people, that uh, family members that live there. They have four cars plus a business truck. Um, a lot of apartments, I'm in an older area in Woodbridge. A lot of the apartments don't have uh, um, uh, garages. They have one carport. So what's going to happen if we have... A, a, a ban, a parking ban between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. What are we supposed to do with our cars? Another problem is that people have out-of-town guests come. I know I, my family lives all over. I have a, a, um, a sister who lives in France, in Northern California, a sister. They come, they rent cars, or they bring their car, and they stay with me for a week. So what, what's going to happen to their cars? Are we all going to lose our cars? Um, at the last Transportation Commission meeting, I discovered that traffic studies do not address the project's impact on parking accessibility. Large residential and commercial projects are being approved without any thought of, about parking availability. As a result, we have severe shortage of parking, which must be addressed. I must, I'm, my suggestion is to develop a bumper stickers for residents who reside in a defined area or, or village, and these residents will be allowed to park on surrounding streets. Um, people who do not have the appropriate bumper sticker could be subject to the 2 a.m. to the 6 um, a.m. parking restrictions, and residents who have overnight town guests should be able to call the police or other authorized entity to arrange for and log guest parking permits 24 7. Thank you. Thank you. Isang Morales, followed by Courtney Santos. <clears throat> Good afternoon, members of the council. My name is Isaac Mireles, and I am a graduate student here studying urban and regional planning. I am the graduate student that proposed and uh, did the professional report on student housing issues at the University of California, Irvine. And so I kind of wanted to go over a few of the findings and um, they're really disheartening uh, to say the least. Currently UCI houses 44% of the student population. Um, they have, they're trying to implement and house 46% by the end of 2018 or 2019. Um, that means 54% of students have to seek housing elsewhere. Essentially, the new direction, um, the definition proposed of housing insecurity is students who lack a fixed or adequate nighttime residency. That includes couch surfing and that includes um, doubling up as well. Um, and also, I also want to add that the, uh, the two questions that my study aimed to, to answer was, what are the housing issues students are facing? And what are, is the current housing stock surrounding UCI? From a sample size of 2,000 students, 8% of students are housing insecure. And like I mentioned before, that was the definition, students who lack an adequate nighttime residence. 30% of students reported experiencing overcrowding, which in this study is categorized by having more than one student in common area and or more than two people per bedroom. What I want members of the council to understand is that this is not a choice, but rather a necessity. Students who reported having housing issues were twice as likely to experience anxiety, depression, or ex extreme stress. So like I just mentioned, it's not that we want to live in these circumstances, it's that financially we just cannot afford anything. What these findings suggest is that the current housing market is just too expensive and thus leading to unorthodox living arrangements. Instead of draconian ordinances that will directly impact students, please consider working with UCI in increasing the housing supply to students. To the people in favor of this ordinance, students are not your enemy. Students are a part of this community and should, be treated, and should not be treated as nuisances. Uh, if anybody wants to see the rest of this report, I will um, feel free to contact me and I can provide my email to whoever uh, would like to see the report. Thank you. Thank you. Courtney Santos, followed by Hans Kraus. Good evening, Mayor Wagner, City Council, and City staff. Congratulations to new Council Members Khan and Quo. My name is Courtney Santos. I have been an Irvine resident and UCI employee for over 13 years. I am a renter 
and a public transit user, and like my amazing students and many youngish professionals in public service careers, I struggle to find affordable housing due to supply constraints exacerbated by our zoning code. I am concerned, deeply concerned, about the proposed warrantless data collection program on renters and landlords that is described on pages three to four of the staff report. Proactive data collection on so many properties is unconstitutionally broad and violates residents' right to privacy. In addition, the proposed narrow definition of single housekeeping unit represents government intrusion into the private lives and lifestyles of our residents. We have basic human rights to define the terms of our relationships and create all kinds of peaceful, voluntary con contracts between consenting adults. Code enforcers have no right to inquire without a warrant whether I live with family, friends, roommates, strangers, or visitors from outer space. You have no right to ask whether we share meals or chores. The city has no right to analyze my social media relationships or to watch who comes and goes from my bedroom. You have no right to interfere in parking arrangements on my landlord's property. It is their property to do as they wish. The right to privacy and the sanctity of the home are core values for all Americans. I believe the proposed code changes are unethical and if implemented as described, would also violate the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution. Neighborhood character, that vague phrase, is a poor justification for violating our fundamental freedoms. Please do not approve these changes. Please continue reactive enforcement. Protect the privacy of law-abiding landlords and renters, and put basic rights, human dignity, and concern for our cherished liberties at the center of any enforcement strategies. Thank you. So Ms. Santos, Hans Kraus, followed by Deyanira Navarez. Hello, my name is Hans Kraus. I've lived in my house in Woodbridge since 1978. Recently, during the past several years, my neighbor has partitioned his 1900 square foot house into two units. He converted his garage into a living space. He put a roof on top of his patio overhang. He provides no on-site parking, zero. There are seven cars associated with this residence parked on the street every single night and every single morning. I've talked to the renters and they told me that he wrote into the rental contract that they are not allowed to park on the driveway. The owner parks his car in front of his driveway to block access to the driveway. We have limited parking space on our street because East Shore Elementary School is directly across the street. And one side of the street is a no parking zone during school hours. So these seven cars occupy the vast preponderance of the available parking spaces on the street. Well, over 100 cars from parents dropping off their kids every morning are scrambling to try to find available places to drop the kids off and end up dropping them off in the middle of the street while other cars are parked diagonally at the corner and directly in front of the crosswalk. Now, why is this an issue? Well, the existing Irvine zoning ordinance for the city of Irvine, chapter 4-3, section 4-3-3, automobile parking requirements states, a single family detached home with four or more bedrooms is required to provide three parking spaces per unit. That was established when the houses were built. Now it's when the houses are modified that these rules are not abided by. It also states two of the spaces should be covered. It also states that one additional space is required for an accessory dwelling unit is a garage living space considered an accessory dwelling unit. The ordinance also states that boarding houses should provide one on-site 
space per rented bedroom. And it also states, quote, all boarding house tenants are required to park on site. Now these were rules that were established when the houses were built. And if a house is modified, it should still abide by the same parking requirements. The issue is parking. Thank you. Thank you. Deanira Navarez. And I don't have your last name on the screen in front of me, sorry. Yeah, hi, good evening. My name is Deyanira Nevarez Martinez, and I am a uh, fourth year PhD student in urban planning and public policy. And I'm here today to speak to you as an Irvine resident, an urban planner, a mother, and an educator. So I wanna introduce you. So as a graduate student, I have a lot of contact with our undergraduate students because I'm a TA. And I want to introduce you today to one of my students. We'll call him Charlie. And Charlie is a wonderful student. And he turns everything in on time. And he puts lots of effort into his homework. And then one day, week six hits, and it all just stops. As a concerned educator, I send him an email. And I say, hey, Charlie, what's going on? What's up? And he informs me that he is now homeless. And he's been dealing with homelessness for a month. And, he, and that is why all of his assignments all of a sudden stop. This is something that happens at UCI a lot, and I encounter it on the day-to-day -day because I am there teaching our students. So this will, uh, uh, ordinance like this will force our students into informal housing markets that may be unsafe and substandard, and worse for property owners and the code than what we already have in place. Even worse, some may end up, like Charlie, homeless. And I'd also like to call attention that as a resident, being here for almost five years, I've noticed that Irvine, the regular Irvine property owner and elected official likes to pretend that um, they could do without UCI. However, I would like to remind everyone in this room that UCI brings an approximate $5 billion to the Orange County economy. Not only that, it is the largest employer in the county. Um, and I find that also interesting, considering that I know that one of you is also seeking elected office countywide. This is not just an Irvine issue. Um, and finally, uh, and much of that money and those resources stay in Irvine. And I would like to ask a question out of, from all of you. What happens to the university when students suffer and when those students disappear? All of those benefits that we all, including the property owners and the taxpayers and all of the residents, um, enjoy, they all go away. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Richard Prince. <laughs> hey, Timothy Houchin. Houchin. Mr. Timothy. Thank you, Council. My name is Richard Prince. I'm a biomedical engineer. As my accent might reveal, I'm not from Irvine originally. I moved here from Tennessee about four years ago. <laughs> where you can imagine it's a lot cheaper to live, but I'm here to say as someone who was raised in a single parent household, there was no money for my college. There was no money to house me while I was in college. And again, this was in Tennessee. So under an ordinance like this, which thankfully we didn't have in Knoxville, I couldn't have gone to college. I couldn't have afforded to live there. Now, fast forward a few years, I'm here in Irvine, and I see this language, and I look around at the undergrads that I work with, at the undergrads that I teach, and what I see is a community that is distraught and damaged because they cannot afford to live here. They cannot afford to study because they have to live out of their cars. This is not something that's emotional, emotionally derived, this is data driven. 20% of students at California community colleges, of which Irvine is home to one, are homeless. That's a fact, the evidence is there to show it. And I know that this ordinance will cause more homelessness in Irvine. This city is beautiful, it is a wonderful place to live, but it should not be a city just for the most well off of us. This city should serve everyone including those students who don't come from backgrounds, who don't have the money to otherwise pay the exorbitant cost of living here. Thank you. Timothy Houchin. Seeing no Mr. Houchin. David McCullough, followed by Kamaran Nouri.
Good evening, Council. Thank you for taking the time to hear this issue. Um, I think of note, you know, I'd like to point out we've heard from a lot of people. I think this is obviously a real issue um, that affects people on both sides of the equation. Um, notably, most of the speakers tonight are here speaking opposed to the de definitional change to single housekeeping unit. Uh, I share that same opposition, and I'm concerned about the continued ambiguity that exists within that definition. Um, I am currently a homeowner. Um, I have rented my home in Irvine for close to 15 years, uh, never had an issue. Uh, I've rented to families, I've rented to graduate students, I've rented to young working professionals. Um, recently, about, well, about a year ago now, um, I, I had my brother, his now fiance, and a couple of their friends living in the home. Um, the HOA took the position that they were not a family and refused to issue parking permits. Now, parking in our community specifically is the real issue, um, and it has been an issue since I originally lived there. Um, there are other homeowners in that same community that the association uh, continued to refuse to supply parking permits too, uh, which was discriminatory against the, the tenants that were living under a, a legal uh, joint and several lease that wouldn't have, wouldn't have violated the existing boarding house definitions. Um, I, have, I have a number of questions. Um, number one, you know, city attorney, you mentioned that you know, you're essentially trying to thread a needle through the two definitions uh, from the cases. I think it's Santa Barbara versus Adamson and State versus Baker, I'm assuming is the other one that you're referencing. Uh, I'd like to understand if there's been further review or if there's review available to the public to ascertain why this definition wouldn't violate either of the findings in those, case, in those cases. Uh, additionally, a staff member mentioned in his reading of the definition that the uh, section two, the Live, to act, Live Together Act is a func functional equivalent of a family unit. This is not meant to apply to friends, coworkers, and I believe a number of other statements. Um, that's not in the definition. And then who's gonna determine who's a friend? How do people become a friend? How do they have psychological commitments to each other? Uh, there's a number of college students here. We were all college students, or at least most of, many of us may have been at some point you find friends, you find roommates over time. Um, housing and parking is a problem. Having 12 people in a six bedroom unit is a problem, but there's occupancy zoning requirements and parking requirements that you guys can put in place when communities are being built to deal with that. It doesn't need to be dealt with in a new definition of what a family is or isn't. Thank you, Cameron Nori, followed by Ken Stahl. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members, and city staff. My name is Cameron Nuri, and I reside in Irvine. Uh, I'm here to urge you to adopt the Planning Commission recommendation and update the boarding house definition. I'm here today to ask you to save our neighborhoods by stopping commercial business activities in our short-term uh, room rental in my neighborhood. We noticed short-term rental activities against the current city code in my neighborhood back in December of 2016. I initially reported it, the activity and um, on, on 2 21 17, almost about two years ago. We collected information, photos, web ad advertisements for months and presented them to the city code enforcement. My neighbors and I and the city of Irvine has a copy of all their signature on file oppose the short-term rental activity in our neighborhood. We do not want commercial businesses, transient lodging, hotel, motel, boarding house in our neighborhood. We need neighbors, not some random transient person saving money or paying the $35 a night uh, for a room on our street. Seven people or seven cars for a four-bedroom house on our neighborhood. We need neighbors that have vested interest in our neighborhood and, and respect the city rules and regulation, not violating them. We do not want some overseas operator or some business entity wasting our city resources by 
finding loopholes in the city hall, city codes, costing the city and wasting my tax dollars. Uh, as you know, city of Irvine has spent a good sum of resources on, on, on this case, and yet they come up short because the operators have found many ways to circumvent the system. We are tired of chasing operators and business owners in, and trying to pr prove to the city that the violators are given the most, that, and that they are violating even the most basic city traffic codes, piling up trash on our streets and not even having a parking space when I come home after work. We are asking to city to be proactive rather than reactive and prevent the overcrowding our neighborhoods and protect the rights of homeowners or the residents of Irvine. Thank you, and once again, I'm asking you to save our neighborhoods. Thank you, Mr. Nuri. Ken Stahl, followed by Azniv Derdzakian. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor. My name's Ken Stahl. I'm an Irvine resident. Also, I'm a professor at Chapman University's Fowler School of Law, where I teach land use and local government law, and I'm uh, one of the members of People for Housing Irvine. I don't want to repeat a lot of the points that have been made. I just want to say briefly that uh, I'm opposed also to the uh, proposed ordinance, particularly about boarding homes, not so much the short-term rental issue. Uh, my, my main point is simply that we shouldn't be telling landowners what to do with their own property, uh, who they can live with, who they can't live with, uh, especially in a situation where, first of all, we're told there's no health or safety justification for the, for the ordinance. There's no issue with the fire code. When this was originally brought to my attention, I thought, well, maybe it was a fire code issue. There's nothing like that in the staff report. There's no public health or safety concern. Uh, the concerns are neighborhood quality of life, which are legitimate concerns, uh, but they have to come second when we're dealing with a situation of a massive housing crisis like we have. Uh, and again, the city shouldn't be telling landowners what to do with their property uh, in a situation where what landowners are doing with their property is actually reducing the cost of housing. I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of statistics. I'll just tell you that Irvine has among the highest housing costs in the entire country. The state of California as a whole uh, is 49th out of 50 in the amount of housing units per capita. And of course, our level of homelessness has increased over 50% just in the last couple of years. Nobody thinks that boarding homes are a great solution to this problem, uh, but at the moment, until we can produce mo the more housing that we need to relieve the shortage, um, it's the best we can do for the time being. Um, other than that, if we start forcing people out of these units, we'll be forcing them into homelessness or into long drives while they'll be increasing greenhouse emissions and increasing traffic. The only other point I want to make briefly is I do believe there's a potential Fair Housing Act issue, not with familial status, but many cities in Texas and other places that have engaged in this sort of code enforcement have run into problems where uh, the laws disproportionately affect people of color or people of uh, national, or national mi origin minorities. Those are protected classes under the Fair Housing Act, and whether it's the intent or not, if it disproportionately affects people of color, then it can be a Fair Housing Act problem. Uh, and given that people of color disproportionately tend to use this kind of living arrangement, it means there's a good chance it will disproportionately affect people protected under the Fair Housing Act. And the city's justification for the ordinance uh, may be a defense, but it isn't necessarily a dispositive defense. Uh, it's something that a court would have to weigh. So there would potentially be a Fair Housing Act problem with this ordinance. So in short, I don't believe that neighborhood character, as important it is, as it is, is a good enough reason to force people out of affordable homes or to tell a landowner what they can do with their property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stahl. Ms. Derzakian, followed by Judah Gamboa. Hello, my name is Osniv Dertakian, and I am a fourth year undergraduate student at UCI. I'm also the first in my family to attend college. I work several jobs to meet my basic needs, yet even then, in order to afford rent, I must live with multiple students in a small apartment off campus. I am here today to urge you all to take a moment and think about the impact that the proposed 4.1 agenda item can have on students like myself. I need you all to understand that students matter, Local, uh, low income folks matter and our basic needs, including housing, should be a concern to you all. I live with five other individuals in a two bedroom apartment. In addition to my own experience, I know of some peers who even live in a living room couch uh, because they have no other fin a realistic financial choice. Therefore, the enforcement that is proposed won't help the obvious social problem that exists in Irvine, housing insecurity, housing affordability, and this enforcement will 
further disenfranchise students and those who face such disadvantages. So I'm asking you all today to listen up and oppose agenda item 4.1, specifically boarding house. Better yet, don't bring it back. Thank you. Judy Gamboa followed by Rebecca Whitehead. Good evening, everybody. My name is Yuta Gamboa, and I come here as a homeowner who has a, a good income. I am, you know, not uh, asking because um, I am poor or anything. So I own the house. The house is big. I used to go to UC Irvine myself. I'm an alumna. And uh, since my five kids have moved out of the house, actually one is still living with us, I would love to rent a room to a UCI student. And I don't see why I should not be allowed to do that. Yeah? So um, my husband and I could play tag in the house. It's so big. And we have all these empty bedrooms and it would just make sense to rent one of the rooms, or maybe even two of the rooms, to students in need for uh, a low rent, we would like to do. Um, we would like to help them and um, do our share, pay back, and uh, be part of this community and alleviate suffering. Because I'm very close to my co my former colleagues and uh, other professors at UCI, and I hear about the housing crisis all the time. So I want to have the right to rent a room to UCI students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gambo. Rebecca Whitehead, followed by Steve Lynch. Good evening, Council. My name is Rebecca Whitehead. I am 20 years old and I am a Irvine resident. I am in strong opposition to this agenda item because as shown by the numbers provided by people giving public comment tonight, as well as the personal stories that we have heard, this proposal would directly displace students, causing students to become homeless, and more importantly, pushing it out of the county as, or out of the city as well. So I wanna talk about the importance of being in close proximity to a college campus. I actually moved from a more rural part of Riverside to come to Orange County for better educational opportunities, and I wanted to be closer to my college so I could have more opportunities to get involved. Now, by basically forcing students to be homeless or displacing them outside of this city, what you would be doing is forcing students to be much farther from their campus. Now, for me, as someone who has the privilege of having a car and I'm able to afford gas, I'm able to commute. But I recognize that other students don't have this privilege. Gas is expensive. Having a car itself is expensive. And people aren't entitled to these luxuries. And when we understand that not everybody has access to these resources, we have to make sure that there's housing options that make sure students are able to be in closer proximity to their campuses. Because close proximity to campuses gets us more involved on our college campuses. And this is extremely important because involvement on college campuses directly leads to the internships that we're going to need in order to pursue our careers. When probably hiring in your offices or businesses, young people out of college, you look to what we did on our campuses. But if this agenda item forces us so far away from these campuses that we can't get involved, we can't get that experience that gets us into offices, that gets us into internships. And so just by talking about the homeless issue itself, which is its own crisis, but also looking at the impact it's going to have on students who might not be homeless but are still forced to go outside of the city, it's going to hurt those students for years. Because if we aren't able to have these internships, this experience on campus, then we're not getting the jobs that we want in our careers. We aren't getting the jobs in your offices that we might be applying for. Because we all know in these hiring practices, college experience does matter. And by directly displacing students through this agenda item, that's exactly what you'd be doing. You'd be hindering our college experiences and you'd be hindering our job opportunities, let alone the homelessness crisis 
that this would create in Irvine or exacerbate in Irvine, I should say. So I am urging you as a council to never bring this agenda item back and really look at the long-term effects as well as the short-term effects of homelessness that this agenda item would cause. Thank you, Ms. Whitehead. Mr. Lynch. And I have no idea who's next. Mr. Lynch, Steve Lynch. Right, and then afterwards. I'm after sorry, that. Olivia Ramassier. Ramassier. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Good evening. <laughs> Our neighborhoods are being invaded by absentee landlords who fail to vet students or even keep track of the students after they move in. Landlords fail to provide them with the rules of the HOA they move into, pack the homes with numerous students, and let the enforcement fall on the HOA boards to babysit these teen adults. Many have, absolutely, uh, many have absolutely no respect for the neighbors. If four students move in with four cars, four additional cars for their boyfriend and girlfriends arrive, plus their party friends. Our HOA has less than one parking space per unit. Full-time uh, residents have nowhere to park. Students who don't live in the park, their cars in our parking lots because they save parking fees from UCI. UCI could care less about our neighborhood. Residents in San Diego actually sued their local college and forced them to provide free parking Businesses and HOA spend thousands of dollars on security and signs to warn UCI students of towing. My new neighbor who recently purchased a condo next to mine immediately went to the city planning for a permit to add a shower in the downstairs bathroom and add three fixtures. In addition, he did not mention on the permit that he cut out the bathroom window and stuck with the hole, cut a new hole in the stucco and put a new bathroom window in, cut a hole through the roof and walled off the living room and the dining room separately with separate entry doors and again without permit. The two bedroom condo is now not a three bedroom, but a four bedroom dormitory. No dining room, no living room, no family room. The condo's front door is now a bedroom door. Their kitchen slider to the patio and the back gate is now the new front door, which uh, opens and closes with talking during all hours of the early morning on weekdays and weekends. The back gate patio is next to our master bedroom. This unit once housed 10 students. I have video and photos of the trouble UCI students bring to the family community. You see students breaking rules, parking in the driveways, failure to bring in their garbage cans after collection days, placing beach chairs on the peak of roofs which cause break, could cause break in tiles and cause serious injuries. Parking cars in red zones which hamper emergency vehicles from reaching residents quickly, having parties between 40 and 100 UCI students Underage drinking, student drinking is just short of toxic poisoning and death. Unable to walk, stand, or speak, getting into cars, driving DUI, littering our neighborhood with red cups, beer cans, hard liquor bottles, and trash. Parties that empty out into the streets and parking lots, waking up residents during all ungodly hours of the morning. The students don't have the maturity, self-respect, or neighborly goodwill to clean up the trash. No apologies for the disruption they caused many neighbors. They could care less. They're not residents, they're just another dormitory living across the street from UCI. We had party goers of women and men riding bicycles and yelling while playing football in the street at 2.30 in the morning. Totally naked. Just a week ago, we had a student race through our neighborhood streets at high rate of speed, focused on taking out numerous garbage cans, sending them airborne, startling residents who went outside up. to see what? You're, you're three minutes. If you could wrap up. Okay. I'm just about done. Um, there are two police reports on that thing. We put up with loud, modified mufflers and cars racing uh, past our homes 24-7, 365. Irvine Police Department and UCPD have been appraised on numerous occasions and have done Thank little to nothing to curb the noise. Thank, Thank you very much. Ne next. Olivia Ramasse, followed by Jasmine. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm a fourth year UCI student and I've lived in Irvine for four years. And based off my experience, the city of Irvine claims to really value the University of California Irvine and what it brings to the city. But in my opinion, you can't claim to value the university if you do not value its students because its students are the ones that bring the life to the university. And we are residents of the city. We do live in this community and many of us vote in this community and many of us want to stay here long term but you cannot talk about this issue without talking about affordable housing and homelessness because this is a real issue that affects students. Students don't live in garages and they don't live in living rooms because they think it's fun and because they want to party and because they want to live with their best friends. They do it because they have no other option and they have nowhere else to go. And if you force them out, the homelessness issue is only going to increase. And personally, as a resident of Irvine, I'm more concerned with homelessness than I am with students 
just trying to get by, just trying to have a place to stay, pay their bills, pay their tuition, pay their rent. And if you go after students, you're not incentivizing them to stay in the community. So they're gonna take all those skills that they get at the University of California, Irvine, and they're gonna go somewhere else that's more friendly and open to young people and young professionals. Thank you. Thank you. And... Husband. Jasmine followed by Bridget, followed by Matthew Downing. All right, no Jasmine, Bridget, floor is yours. Brigitte, excuse me. Uh, first, I wasn't prepared to talk on this topic. I was talking to something else, but I, at the risk of sounding like Eddie Haskell, I gotta commend you, Mr. Chairman, that you had well over 10 speakers and you could have said, oh, there's only two minutes each speaker, and you didn't. You gave them all three minutes, and you should be applauded for your respect to the, your uh, constituents. Um, man, I, I, you know, I have to come to speak uh, because I think the tribe has spoken. Um, the most dangerous thing a private citizen can hear is, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. We don't need no stinking clipboards in people's homes telling them what they can do and can't do. We've all been youths, you know, playing naked football. Come on, everyone, we do dumb things when we're youths. But these youths uh, are speaking a very compelling argument to say, and, and, and I gotta commend the youth, they should be home studying. Instead here, they're engaging in the democratic process, which is real uh, a, a compliment to these uh, young people that they have something to say, and that I would encourage these youths, any civil rights movement, any groundswell church revival starts with the youths. Doesn't start with the elders, starts with you guys. So you guys are lighting a fire. This is about me versus them. It's a slippery slope. What's the, oh yeah, we got to have code enforcement. We got to have respect. But what what about self reliance? What about the owner working it out if there's too much parking? Why do we have to come crying to the gov the government's got to step in? That's the point. Elias spoke here earlier. A Russian Jewish he took his Jew his autistic adult son from his home. The government. And now he can't even talk to him on the telephone. Uh, this is a slippery slope. If code people could come in with a clip, oh, you violated this, oh, you violated this, the next thing is, oh, gee, uh, your grandmother visited last weekend. I don't think you, that's a violation of code. No, I hope these youths fight tooth and nail for their right. Our, our, our um, uh, American Government, our, uh, America was founded on boarding houses. Look at any old movie, you'll see boarding houses. You know, my Babushka and Dedushka and Wasco had, uh, at, how do you think they hired the laborers? They had boarding houses. That's not to encourage people to turn their houses into boarding houses, but they're part and parcel of the American spirit. They shouldn't be cut out. And the youths need these things. And if they if trash, then, then they'll clean it up. They're not animals. They're youths. So this is a slippery slope. I hope you listen to the youths. Thank you very much. Matthew Downing, followed by Scott Couchman. Matthew Downing, Scott Couchman. So boarding houses are bad news for neighborhoods. We had one across the street from us for two years. Trash, weeds, traffic, noise, Uber drivers knocking on doors asking where the hotel was, increased crime, excessive on-street parking, drunk and rude tenants, and constant turnover. We've had it all. Boarding houses are illegal in Irvine for a reason, but it took two years and countless meetings with the Irvine City staff and legal team Irvine City Council, Irvine Planning Commission, the Code Enforcement Appeal Process, four appearances at the Orange County Superior Court, and last but not least, a minimum of two police 
undercover operations to finally get the illegal boarding house operator to plead guilty, pay her thousands of dollars in fines, and finally close their illegal boarding house. We have to make this easier. We are not here tonight to debate boarding houses. They are illegal in Irvine. We're here to make this existing boarding house code easier for code enforcement to enforce. Save the city thousands of dollars, countless man hours of staff time, quickly identify and notify illegal boarding house operators, and again, rid this city of these illegal activities. I wanna thank the three returning uh, members of this council for their unanimous support for Irvine, Irvine neighborhoods um, last April when they all affirmed their opposition to boarding houses. And I wanna, I wanna thank uh, Council Member Quo for proposing this code change. And I wanna um, ask Council Member Khan, I ask you to support these items because it takes neighbors to build neighborhoods and neighborhoods are important in Irvine. Our neighborhood has experienced what happens when illegal boarding houses intrude into neighborhoods. I ask you to keep commercial activities in commercial districts, support our neighborhoods by making it easier to identify offenders and close down illegal activities. I support the new boarding house code and the short-term rental changes. Thank you very much. Thank you. No other speakers. All right, that completes public comments. Let's bring it back to the council. Uh, our system is down, so gang, let me. I'm sorry, I'm Mayor. Sorry. One more speaker, Mr. Andy Zelenko. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Zelenko, come on down. You have three minutes. Floor is yours. Is there any reason for those friggin' red and white lights? They're a very distraction to the community or, or the, no, the ones right in front of these two council members here. You don't see them? We can't see them. The audience them. see them? Anyway, anyway, I don't know. Um, with very sincere respect to those who need housing, and I appreciate all the students coming forward, please try to think of and show some respect to those who sacrifice many years to secure a home to raise a family. Maybe someday you will have an opportunity to own a family home and understand. A sincere thanks to all those who have endured the years of BS or the bureaucratic shuffle to, for, to bring this boarding housing versus Irvine family homes forward. The 12 pages of the agenda item, enforcement strategy and defining the words boarding house or rooming house. Boarding houses in Irvine family neighborhoods are not the answer to affordable housing in Irvine. These Irvine family homes used as boarding houses are businesses operated in family neighborhoods and we need to, your immediate corrective action to terminate them. Within one of our immediate family neighborhood, is at two Champlain with parking added to the problem. Please confirm and identify the violations and fines for these short-term rentals. Example, turn off the electricity and water. Northwood, North Park HOA has a fine violation for this activity of $7,500 per month for as long as the violation continues after the notice. Also, owners are prohibited from advertising the rental for a period of less than 90 days. I'm uh, trying to figure out how much time I have left. Um, from that after after form. Also, more than please add home businesses to this agenda item that are operating care homes. They are occupied with at least six care persons and at least two care takers. Two of the homes are at 7 Princeton and 17 Yorktown with the owner, Alex Valley, having 14 other such business houses in other family neighborhoods. Boarding houses in Irvine family neighborhoods are not the answer to affordable housing. Irvine family homes are family homes. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lenko. Does that conclude public comments? Mayor, Mr. Yes. Um, Downing is back. Oh, all right. Mr. Downing, three minutes. Hi. 
I'm a student at UC Irvine. Um, so I think UCI is a huge part of why Irvine has the property value it does. Furthermore, students represent UCI when they choose to live here later or where they go or, or whenever they move elsewhere after graduating. So homeowners and the city have a responsibility and an interest in offering better legal affordable housing alternatives. You don't have to go far at UCI to meet students who are living in triples and in common areas of apartments. Like, we, we don't like this, but we have to do this. I know someone who had to live with a boyfriend who turned out to abuse, be abusive, and luckily they're broken up now, but because of her housing situation, she wasn't able to afford cost of living, and she's dropped out of UCI in part because of that. Um, so 4.1 says the issue is like poor living standards caused by overcrowding, but overcrowding itself is caused by a lack of affordable housing. I'm worried that 4.1 focuses too much on overcrowding and not the root problem. 4.1 criminalizing boarding homes will cause more students to live in cars or live further out, or like, <laughs> I mean, it also criminalizes overnight parking, so you can't really live in cars, so they'll definitely be uh, forced out of Irvine. And if they're living outside of Irvine, um, that basically guarantees that you'll see more students coming into Irvine and parking their cars around. Um, because I know that when we're living together and we know we can share cars, sometimes we just don't choose to bring our cars. So yeah, please focus on the root cause. Thank you. All right, thank you all. All right, let's bring it back to the council, and I have Council Member Quo followed by Council Member Kwan. Con, excuse me, Quo and Con. Pro and Con, Co and Con. Please, go, speak. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate everyone who came and spoke this evening. Um, appreciate the opportunity to have had a number of conversations offline, not just this past weekend, but over probably what's been many, many years. Um, let me first say that while I appreciate those who have come to offer their comment today, um, some of the way those comments have been presented have been somewhat bothersome. Um, whether you recognize it or not, over this meeting, over the past number of weeks. Um, we've been called insensitive. We've been called all sorts of issues. Um, when I've had tried to have conversations with people about this, um, I'm often met with the response, um, which as was, has happened tonight, you don't understand. So let me share a couple of points. I rented a room here in Irvine in University Park from an older couple. And when I look back at that time, we were a, I don't even remember what the term we're using anymore, household, housekeeping unit. We had free reign of the home. We don't live together now. I still call them on their birthdays. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a home in a neighborhood where there's six people living there. None of them know each other's names. That's the difference. And maybe the, those are two wildly different examples on far ends of the spectrum, but I think that that's something that I'm sensing from the conversation tonight is that there isn't a desire to find middle ground. There's a desire to say, if you're for this, then you're one way, and if you're against it, you're another way. The second point that I want to bring up, and I'm not trying to grandstand here, but I'll tell you that less than 10 people know this, but I'm going to tell you, and Council Member Shea knows this, I don't have the best relationship with my mother. And part of the reason is because I slept on the floor of her living room junior and senior year of high school. So when I get comments from people like, you don't understand, I slept on the floor of the living room, not on a mat, not on the sofa, on the floor. 
In fact, one summer it was a shared floor because my cousin from Canada came to town because my mom was trying to be a good aunt to him, whatever the case may be. I have worked with neighborhoods, whether it was from the ranch, the Northwood, all parts of town where we are experiencing issues that are a direct result of boarding houses and short-term rentals. I had a conversation with someone from this community this weekend and I said, it's not a secret that I'm Republican. It's not, but I'm gonna say something that's really not Republican. What you do in your house, I don't care. If you are a single man living in an eight bedroom house with 20 cats, more power to you. If you're 12 college kids living in a two bedroom condo, that's what works for you, that's what works for you. But when your neighbors are calling and upset about the parking, when we're driving by and there's no landscaping, when the trash cans are out on a Friday and trash day was Tuesday, that's when I care. And so to the extent that we can find a solution to the root problem, and I had a conversation about this too, the root problem is that, and I, I hate to throw them under the bus because things have improved significantly. The root problem is that UCI wants to admit more and more students, and that's a great thing, but they don't plan for what happens afterwards. They don't say, oh, well, we're gonna let this many students in. Gosh, we need to widen roads. We need to hire more officers. We need more chairs in the dining room. We need more housing on campus. They don't think about that. They're really, really good at educating students. They're really, really not good at land use and planning and community building. And that is the job of this council, is to build a community. And you have heard from residents that they don't feel the character of the neighborhood is the same. In fact, you've had people come to this microphone and attack the concept of protecting neighborhood character. That is not community building. And so I'm, I'm bothered by a lot of the rhetoric on here. Room sharing is not being criminalized. So for those of you who are pushing that theory, you have read the proposal wrong. And for those of you who have read the proposal and still think that's the case, you've still read the proposal wrong. Am I wrong, Mr. Holtz? Is room sharing illegal? No, it is not. Okay. We have zero ability to regulate the housing on campus. They wanna add 10,000 units, guess what? They can do it. They don't have to come here. They don't have to come to City Hall. They don't have to file an application. They are their own land use planning agency. Maybe that's an, another reason they're not good at planning because they don't plan it. Um, we've been accused of waging a war. We had a man that came up here and, and maybe it's because I'm new. I can't remember the last time I had scripture quoted to me from, from the podium. So I've been accused of waging a war, having no values, being evil, um, being insensitive. Well, let me quote some scripture back to you. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Matthew said, by your fruits you shall know them. So the people who have been opposed to this have been the ones accusing others of being mean. The people that are in support of this have said, look, we just wanna live our lives. We bought this home, we're living here. You know, we had this poor man talking about you know, naked football on bicycles. Let me tell you, I have never played naked football on a bicycle, period. And we had some people, and I get that it's a very odd thing, thought that that was funny. It's not funny when you have to live with it. It's not funny when you're woken up by at 2.30 2 in the morning and, and you gotta get to work because you gotta pay your bills to pay that mortgage. This is whether you want to like the concept or not about 
the character of our neighborhoods. If there is a solution that has nothing to do with what's going on inside the house, but solves every, you know, all the things that we're frustrated about, parking and trash and, and noise, bring it forward. But I don't think that solution exists. And well, I mean, and I'm happy to you entertain comments. I'm happy to entertain proposals. Um, we have the option of voting this up, voting it down, amending it, we, we can do whatever we want tonight on this. But I, I just feel like a lot of the comments tonight have really been disingenuous. Um, I have a lot of other notes, but I'm gonna let others have a turn. All right, Council Member Kahn. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanna thank everyone that came out here today and spoke up, whether you were for this or against it, it takes a lot to find time to show up at a city council meeting and speak up. But I'd also like to thank all the people that have been emailing us and um, making phone calls. Um, one of the things that I'd like to do is maybe walk everyone through um, what is being proposed, because I think there's a lot of, um, there's, there's not, not a lot of clarity right now and from some of the things that I've been hearing and I've been going back and forth with staff, I know I've been asking a lot of the questions that are coming through um, as people are contacting me, but I just wanna clarify once again that we are not opposing boarding homes. We're just suggesting that they go through the CUP process. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And um, we are not defining boarding homes as just being single housekeeping units. We are clarifying the difference between a boarding home and what a single housekeeping unit is. Is that correct? We're adding the definition of single housekeeping unit to the definition of boarding house. Okay. It's, a, it's a new term. So, okay. So when I'm reading the definition here, it says boarding house, any residence or dwelling unit or portion thereof wherein it's two or more of its occupants are subject to separate rental agreements, then B, the occupants do not operate as a single housekeeping unit. So it says occupants do not operate as a single housekeeping unit. Is that correct? That would constitute a boarding house if they are not a single housekeeping unit. Okay, so we're not stating that boarding houses are to be single housekeeping units. That's correct. Okay. And so now, when it comes to um, this issue criminalizing the youth, I, I really don't feel that that's our intent. I, yes, is there a housing crisis here, not only in Orange County, but in Irvine? Yes, do we need more affordable housing? Yes, we do. But is this issue um, affecting students to live in homes with roommates? Um, I don't think so. All we're asking the homeowners to do is pull the permit so that they are able to claim their homes as a boarding house so that students can then rent them. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and Council Member Fox. Thank you. Well, I, I don't think that any council member up here wants to add to the issue of homelessness, wants to bar people from our communities, or wants to make housing more difficult for students, or restrict basic uh, rights for homeowners. I think that may be uh, the effect of this legislation or the, of this ordinance. But, uh, Everything that we have heard from the concerned neighbors about short-term rentals and boarding homes are very important issues in our community. They are, they, they are public nuisances. They constitute crimes and certainly are ticketable offenses with blocking of the parking. I think we saw, um, you know, uh, parking on reds, and I'm concerned that there hasn't been 
enforcement. I, I know that we have had nuisance conditions in the city that have gone years and years and years without um, any kind of enforcement. For example, um, hoarder conditions. You know, we need to be on top of these issues. And I think neighborhood character is very important and preservations of our neighborhoods are very, very important. And I think perhaps we can take a look at um, border, I don't know, not border homes, what is it, uh, boarding houses, and better define the problems that we're facing in the neighborhoods. I am extremely concerned about the language in this um, ordinance, whether or not other cases have found it to be supportable or not. For example, why would you put a city in the position of determining whether or not individuals living under one roof share houses, I mean, share um, expenses or chores? You know, you get, who's doing the dishes in your house? What kind of a question is that? Um, and how do we determine what constitutes a family unit based on relationship? Um, I know we've had a lot of students here, and certainly UCI is the second largest employer in Orange County, one of the largest in our city, um, and we are supportive of our students. But there is another population that has emailed us and that has reached out to us um, in our offices, which is the senior community, and being having the ability to stay in their home if they can you know, rent out rooms um, is a very, very important uh, issue that we have not dealt with. How are we even going to obtain leases from landowners? They have no requirement to turn them over. We've already indicated that they've refused to do so in the past. Now, when we're talking about someone who has modified their, uh, their residence with cut out walls, and uh, major structural modifications that sound like they're completely unsafe, unpermitted, we have remedies for that. And there's no reason why it should take two years for the city to do something about that. We should be able to get on that right away. And hiring this company, this consultant, they're not going to do that. They're just gonna examine social media, right? And that's my, it, let me ask, is that is that what they're, they're not actually physically going out to residences requesting documents and determining whether or not they're a boarding home? Uh, Councilmember Fox, the, the consultant would be specifically working on short-term rentals, and they would merely be searching the internet for listings of short-term rentals within the city of Irvine. Well, I do that all the time. When people say that there's no you know, Airbnb, I just pull up the rentals and I point at them. I mean, that seems $65,000 seems like a lot of money just to do that. But um, And my concern of, of short-term rentals, uh, I have much less concern about that. That's a commercial business. Um, maybe we might want to think about regulating it so there are no impacts in the neighborhood, but there clearly there isn't the same kind of outcry against short-term rentals and modifying the ordinance as there is against boarding homes. But what we should be doing is being more on top of the neighborhood impacts such as parking, um, illegal modifications, unpermitted changes to housing. Uh, th these are things that we already have sufficient language on our books to go after, and it's the responsiveness in the community that I'm, uh, lack of responsiveness by our staff that I'm concerned with. Um, and again, I've seen it myself with the issue of um, quarters and, and our city being very reluctant to pursue litigation. Um, but clearly there is a need in our community to do that. So the language of being a close group with social commitments to each other, psychological commitments to each other, how do we measure that? And whether or not there's a case that says that that's okay, that's been upheld by the Ninth Circuit or not, I mean, that's something that our government should not, or our city government should not be getting into. And I can't be supportive of language such as that, though I can support the short-term rental issue. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Shea. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity. I, number one, I, I want to state I'm very sensitive to our students and their housing needs. It, it, um, several years ago, several uh, UCI students came here to 
the city and talked about problems with even having enough food to eat, and it just broke my heart. In fact, I invited a couple over to have spaghetti with me. Um, so we worked on expanding the food bank on campus. So you're part of the community, and we need to be sensitive to you. I um, actually live in a community in Quail Hill and townhomes, and over the course of years, I purchased my house actually at a good time, at a good price. Uh, but there's three um, homes now that are clearly boarding houses, and I raised my granddaughter in my house. She just moved in with her mother a year ago, but for eight to nine years, she lived with me as a young girl, and we had some wild parties next door, two doors down. And we would walk the dog to the park, and you'd see vodka bottles all over the sidewalk and cigarettes, and it was a huge problem. And the landlord just didn't care. He wasn't monitoring it. So it is a problem. And we are actually, um, as your elected officials, we're required not only to defend our students and those that are renting, but we're also here to have to defend our homeowners and those that move to the city to a master plan community that we market, have marketed for over 40 years and that people invest their hard-earned money. They went to college, they got out, they raised families, they got jobs, and they bought homes here in Irvine, and we have to protect their interest as well. I have to protect my interest, it's my home as well. It's not that easy to buy a home anymore, as many of you will learn when you get out of school. I wanna read some statistics here, because I really think the issue, um, number one, boarding houses are illegal, it's, they just are already, so uh, maybe it's the language, that seems to be the problem, but they're, they're illegal and we can't be allowing them and we need to have stronger enforcement. I think that's what the problem is. We need to deal with that. Um, but as someone mentioned, UCI is, you know, produces over billions of dollars into the Orange County economy and they do. And they're very wealthy. So why aren't they providing the housing for you that you need and they should be providing for you and they're putting it on this community we have no control over their sanctuary island of a university. We can't control their traffic. We can't control anything that goes on their campus. But then they're not sensitive to us when they are not providing the proper housing and needs for all of you students. To hear that you're all living in really substandard, and many of you living arrangements, is just unacceptable. And I want to read some of these um, statistics that my staff pulled up. In February 2016, UCI officials announced a plan to increase its student population by about 9,000, bringing the total population to about 40,000 within 10 years, and to increase the number of faculty members by 250 within five years. Since that announcement, the total student population has increased approximately 3,275 students, in the fall of 2016, there were 33,467. And in the fall of 2018, there were 36,742. In a letter received, and this is a, an article from the Register, um, from Associated Students of UCI, it states that only 48% of students even live on campus. That's just outrageous. This is their responsibility. You pay a large amount of money to go to school there, they should provide affordable housing for you. It's their responsibility. And it's just outrageous in my mind to think that their lack of responsibility to provide proper housing for you that's affordable, that's safe, that, that's um, you know accommodating to your needs as students that should be focused on your education, and they're putting this on us and our homeowners that um, we're like battling one another and it shouldn't be that way. We need to be cohesive and have a community of harmony. I have worked extensively over the years for affordable housing in this city, providing 10% of affordable housing for our veterans, for developmentally disabled. I've worked on the land trust for over 10 years with uh, Council Member Fox and others to really care about those that are um, you know, suffering and, and don't make the, the money that many others have been able to do in our community. So it's not that we're insensitive up here, but we have to kind of cut the baby and make a decision of what has to be done. And we're a city of rules and laws. We're not just gonna vacate laws and our rules because of the inappropriate approach to housing that UCI is adhering to. 
So my suggestion, um, after we hear from the mayor and others, is that I would like to create a work um, committee that would be maybe with the mayor, um, Irvine, um, the Irvine company, perhaps Five Points, our staff. We need to sit down with the decision makers at UCI and talk to them about their need to partner with the city, their need to provide appropriate housing for you. They need to care for you. And I'm appalled of what has gone on. It isn't on us. We're not being insensitive to you. It's the very campus and leadership that you are attending that is the problem, in my opinion. So, so that would be my proposal besides uh, um, supporting the fact that our staff needs to solve this problem. We have a boarding house problem. We have an issue. I don't know. I'm, I'm a little concerned about how we're moving from just enforcing it when you get a call compared to this new language. Maybe I could ask our staff in regard to that. If someone calls you and said there's a boarding house, there's problems, how, you, how do you then enforce it? I mean, do you go in and ask people who, how many live there? Do you go through that process that you're asking us to do and legitimize now? Or how do you actually address a boarding house problem? Sure. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Shea, I, I would say two things. One, with regard to proactive enforcement, that's purely on the short-term rental side. Boarding houses would continue to be a complaint-based approach, um, and typically the way we handle that situation is upon complaint, our first step is to reach out to the registered owner, gather more information about the situation. Per our current code, we have to get a hold of leases to prove the, um, to prove the, the fact that there's a boarding house in place. The, the point of the change in the ordinance is to uh, easy, make it easier to enforce by um, way of not having to get the lease once we can establish that it's a boarding house in terms of residents not knowing each other, not being a, a typical roommate situation. It allows us to take the next step to enforcement without getting the well, lease. Well, let me ask, practically speaking, you knock on a door, right? Because I understand the concern of how this could be implemented, and we want to be cautious about certain people's privacies, obviously I agree with that, but certain people's privacy also invades other people's privacy, so we have to keep that balance. How do you, just practically, how is this done? Because, I mean, do we just bang on the door? Or like, like for instance, my neighbor around the corner, I can't get into details, but there were violations in the home. But we sent an inspector out. Is that not what we do? And there, then the inspector knocks on the door and says that we've heard there's been a complaint. And if they don't let us in, we can go to court and get an injunction or something to go in. Is that what you see would happen here with the boarding homes to prove that there's multiple um, folks living there? So a lot of times boarding house uh, cases are a result of other complaints that code enforcement gets, whether it's about litter or parking or other concerns. And in talking with the complaining party about what the concerns are, that leads staff to believe that it might be a boarding house situation. And so, as Pete mentioned, we do reach out to the property owner. We also send an inspector out to the property, knock on the door, and if they answer, we engage them in conversation and just try to hear um, what the situation is, hear their response to the complaints that have been issued. Um, oftentimes, um, if it does appear to be a boarding house, we would ask if they, if the tenants or the property owner would be willing to share their lease documents with us. Because if they had one lease document under our current code, then it wouldn't be a boarding house. Um, but oftentimes we're being refused that. And so um, ultimately, if it persists, if the complaints persist, uh, the our only remedy is to go to court. Okay, so that's how we would resolve it. Because uh, this gentleman here showed us pictures of what this uh, home near him uh, did, but he had clear um, you know, evidence of what's gone on. And so if a resident is having a problem, they actually, and it's legal to take pictures of, of you know, these changes, and like you did with putting the, showing the chairs on the roof, which is <laughs> really outrageous. I'm getting too old to remember when I misbehaved a bit. Um, and it was just a bit, I wasn't that bad. Um, so, so that's what we would do. So if we change the language now and we couldn't get any compliance, we just go to court if we have evidence and they would give us an injunction. But you just have getting much more complaints, so we need to, 
Are we videotaping this at all? Because we just have that up there. Are we not of course, showing yes. staff and is that okay? I, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? No, I totally forgot it because I got off track. So, so uh, the, it was the, about going to court. Yeah, for yeah. the injunction. Just so, more details about how that works. Right. So the thought the thought is with the single housekeeping unit provision, if it were to be approved, if uh, property is suspected to be a boarding house, it is believed to be a boarding house and they uh, refuse to provide their lease documents, then we could progress to the next level of enforcement, which would be a citation. And oftentimes, uh, when a property owner is receive, receives a citation, uh, they have an opportunity to appeal that and have that heard by a hearing officer, at which time, if they were to appeal a citation, they would have an opportunity to bring their lease documents to show that it's not a boarding house. Okay. So it, it's, it's intended to um, be able to take that next step without having to go to court. Because that's expensive, but do we pass the, the cost on to the person that's failing to comply with our codes and our laws? No. We can't do that? No. We do have uh, citations that we can issue, but that's not based on staff costs. Well, not staff costs, but the cost to go to court, right? That's a little different than your daily staff activities, would you not say? But we're not allowed to do that? Mayor Pro Tem Shea, uh, it's a never say never situation. In the typical case, it is more efficient for us to choose the path of least resistance. Uh, if we have to go to court, go quickly and get the relief we need. There are opportunities, there are m means of doing it through a receivership or a nuisance proceeding, but it takes a long time and sometimes it's not worth the possibility of recouping your fees. And, and I would add, we're really off track a little bit right, from the sorry. change in the policies. Okay, and I so just wanted to figure out how this all worked out, and I think it, it was an interest to people to see yeah. how we enforce it. Okay, so thank you. I appreciate you giving me the extra time to ask questions and to share my comments with the community. Thank Count, you. Councilmember Khan. Okay, I've been hearing a lot of concern about some of the language that's um, in the definitions, and I know we went over the clarity of it, but do you think there's a possibility that we can remove um, item B2 from the definition of single housekeeping unit? Because I think item um, B1 and B3 by themselves would be enough to support what a single housekeeping unit is. The challenge with taking out the functional equivalent of the family language is that it takes us back to requiring lease documents, which is where we're at today. Can I just keep... All right. I mean, I think it, it, it would be a, a... I'm trying to understand if this item right here, B2, is something that is hard for us to justify or to capture the um, information from, then why is it here? Can we apply it? Can we not apply it? I don't know. Councilmember Khan, if I can weigh in, the reason that piece is there um, is purely to aid in enforcement. If through the informal conversations that Mr. Holtz mentioned, a code enforcement officer is able to elicit some information about the relationship of the borders it allows us to move to the next step of enforcement, education, then citation, actually without having to get a lease. And so the purpose of B2 is to establish a lower barrier for uh, defining boarding house, a lower barrier of proof on behalf of the code enforcement officer to move forward. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I'll, I'll weigh in briefly. Um, completely supportive of the issue. I read the AS uh, uh, student letter, in fact, and then we had it read to us and we had somebody quote the one statistic in it that is significant. I think the only statistic in it that's significant and it doesn't help their case at all. The, that 30% of UCI students report conditions of serious overcrowding in their living spaces. We do not help that situation by ignoring the ongoing serious overcrowding in their living spaces. So if that statistic is correct, 
and I don't doubt it, you wrote it in your letter, your researcher told it to us, somebody read it to us as if we couldn't read it ourselves, um, that is one of the issues we are trying to deal with here. And as a number of our homeowners have said, those conditions spill out into the neighborhoods and they do affect the quality of life in our neighborhoods. And it isn't the case that the only thing driving this city is UCI. It is great. It is a wonderful partner with us in so many ways. It, like this city government, as an institution that is made up of human beings, is not perfect. And as was said, I think, very cogently by the mayor pro tem, needs to grapple further with the issue. Maybe this is the way that it does that grappling. And it does so now in the face of the council saying we're hearing our residents and are very cognizant of challenges to the quality of life that these boarding houses request. Um, been lots of legal questions. They've all been answered to everyone's satisfaction. Of course not. That's what makes for legal disputes. If there is one, our lawyer tells us we will be able to defend this. Um, one guy sounded like a lawyer stands up and talks about threading a needle and, and citing cases and that's what lawyers do, cite cases. What do the cases tell us the law is and where can we go within the law? Uh, hats off to staff, hats off to, count, uh, to counsel for their efforts in helping us tighten up what was always the rules and the law here in the city of Irvine. See no further discussions, let's vote on the item. Oh, we, you did, didn't you? Did you make a motion? No. Oh, make it, go ahead and make the motion. I'll let Anthony, a little ahead of myself okay. here. Anthony, why don't you make the motion? Okay, all right. Okay. Well, it, it's an ordinance that needs to be read. There was an amendment you were talking about, I thought. So why don't you go ahead and make it? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. What I would like to do is approve and introduce for the first reading, but how would I, I want to address the fact that I would like to create a subcommittee, oh, two Can motions, so separate. make the first motion. Okay, the first motion I would like to make is to um, move that we would create a working group, uh, maybe two or three, four meetings, that we would invite our city manager, city, the mayor, um, uh, representatives from the Irvine Company, per perhaps from Five Points, and our staff to uh, meet with UCI representatives to start very aggressive conversations about providing appropriate housing for the students that they are um, uh, engaging with on their campus. So that's my that's first That's the motion. first half of your motion. Yeah. And, and the my second, second would ordinance. be introduced for first reading and read by title only an ordinance of the city council of the city of Irvine, California, approving an amendment zone change. Let me get my glasses on here, sorry. Uh, ZZ765178 PZC to section 121 of the city's zoning ordinance related to the definition of a boarding house. I'll second, or well, are we taking both motions or? Yeah, we, we can take them both. There's no okay. reason. I'll second both motions. In, unless the council, if there's a call to divide the question from the council, which I don't see. Okay. All can, right, so can we'll, I, we'll I, I know that we, you were talking about this committee and I'm probably gonna get a dirty look from the lovely lady in yellow, could I suggest that one of this council's representatives who also serves on the land trust that provides the affordable housing serve on this delegation? I'm, t I'm totally I'm open I'm not necessarily to saying it's me, I'm just saying I think right. it should. It ought to be one of us. Well then we could have two ca the mayor and a council member. I'm fine with that, I, I just wanna get this moving so we can start addressing yeah. this very serious problem in our community. Thank you. Right. Moved and seconded, further discussion. Seeing well, none. Oh, I would just say I'm I'm supportive of the committee. It's my issue is the language in the um, first in the ordinance. Do you want to bifurcate house. it? Um, no. Well, do we? Yeah. Do we do I mean, let's bifurcate it so that it's clear. Because right. I'm supportive of the committee, right. but not the whole. We'll committee. we'll vote we'll vote first on the um uh, the committee idea. Okay. All right. So can we be, can we be clear what the title is that we're voting on so that I'm. This is just we, the establishment of a committee to meet with UCI yeah. to talk about okay. uh, working toward as, finding as appropriate you housing yep. as, as I discussed. Councilmember Khan, did you vote? Yes, 
Thank you. All right, it Union. looks like this carries unanimously. Now we're on the second part, which is the ordinance. Let's vote on it. It's showing up because it's, I, it's my light. It's keep keep on. trying, people. There we go. Oh, there we go. And that carries four to one. All right. Thank you all. We are now at item 5.1. Because of a prior commitment, I am going to um, uh, leave and turn the balance of the calendar over to Mayor Pro Tem Shea. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and we'll be talking to you soon. There's the script. Keep us updated, will you? Okay. Uh, at this time, would our staff please introduce the item before us? Or our city clerk, I'm sorry. That's the ordinance establishing changes to bidding threshold for public works contracts. And if our staff will introduce themselves. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Shea and council members. My name is Portia Mina and I'm the city's purchasing agent. Joining me tonight is Scott Smith, the Deputy Director of Public Works. Tonight before you is a request to amend the Municipal Code to update the bidding thresholds for Public Works projects. In 2003, the City Council adopted the California Uniform Public Construction Cost Accounting Act. The Act establishes accounting and bidding procedures set forth by the State Controller pursuant to Public Contract Code. Every five years, public construction costs are reviewed by the state to determine if there have been material changes. As a result of the most recent review, Assembly Bill number 2249 was approved, which increased the bidding limits for public works <coughs> projects for agencies who adopted the act. The public contract code changes were effective January 1st, 2019. The ordinance before you increases the city's bidding thresholds for public works projects to reflect those newly established limits set by the state. The increased limits are listed in the staff report as well as summarized in the current slide. By adopting the ordinance, the city will once again align itself with the act. Some benefits the city will realize include advertising cost savings for public works projects between $175,000 and $200,000, as well as reduced project timelines. Additionally, staff would have the flexibility to self-perform work or negotiate contracts for public works projects up to $60,000, resulting in administrative time and cost savings. An errata memo is in your, sup I'm sorry, your supplemental packet this evening. The errata reflects document corrections. Attachment three is corrected to update the bidding thresholds, which require bidder security. These specific thresholds did not reflect updated bidding limits. Additionally, Exhibit A to the ordinance and Attachment 4 were mistakably the current municipal code and did not reflect the new bidding thresholds. These documents have been updated and replaced in their entirety. This concludes my presentation, and we are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I appreciate your presentation. Are there any questions of my council colleagues? Hearing none, is there a, um, any public speakers? No. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion, uh, uh, then a motion is in order. Madam Mayor, move to introduce for first reading and read by title only an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Irvine, California, amending portions of the Irvine Municipal Code relating to, oh, this is one of those ones you don't have to read, do you? I don't think so. Oh, okay, whoops. But, but you'll ma you made the motion, we have a second? A second. Um, okay, this time we'll vote, please. If these work. Yes, did that come through? Motion passes four to one with the mayor, I'm sorry, four to zero with the mayor absent. Thank you so much. Okay, at this time we'll move to item 5.2, uh, which is an ordinance approving amendment to the Irvine Municipal Code to authorize city manager to appoint, remove, promote, or demote city officers and department heads. At this time, I will turn to Jeff Melching, who I believe, if he would come back. We're, oh, oh, you're over there. <laughs> why, why did you go over there? I can see you. <laughs> I, I look over, I go, what the heck happened? Did you go to the restroom, go get a salad? <laughs> Welcome. 
Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the City Council. Um, tonight, uh, the item before you are a couple of amendments to the Municipal Code that sort of streamline certain personnel decisions um, that would be made by the City Manager. Uh, just by way of background, Irvine City Charter gives the City Council the power to set the procedures for the appointment, removal, powers and duties of the City Manager. And one of the key powers and duties of the city manager in every city <laughs> is to effectively um, steer the personnel ship in terms of deciding who is an employee and who's not a city employee. That includes uh, appointments and terminations and, uh, and promotions and demotions. Um, so effectively, the way that it works in a council manager form of government is that the city council selects the city manager and then in turn entrusts the city manager to advance the city council's priorities and to lead the administration of the city. And as much as fundamentally said um, in the municipal code. So it is at its core a coupling of the responsibility to manage the city with the authority to pick the team. Those, are, those two things go together. Um, the current Irvine Municipal Code doesn't do it 100% that way. Right now, what it says is that for most employees in the city, the city manager has full authority over personnel decisions. But for, people, for certain directors and officers of the city, the authority is more limited. The city manager has the responsibility for making the decision, but it's only made with the prior approval of the city council. And what in the real world that means is that every time a decision to promote or demote or appoint or remove an employee is made and it's at a director or officer level, that then is going to require prior approval of the city council, which is something that occurs um, at a closed session because that's the only way the council acting at a body on a personnel matter can really act. Um, and so th that ends up taking a certain amount of time in order to, uh, to come to fruition. Um, so we have come up with proposed revision. And the proposed revision has a simple goal, and that is to preserve city council oversight without necessitating that every personnel decision go to a separate closed session. So what does that do? It improves efficiency from the point in time when the decision is made to the point in time when the decision is implemented. In the normal course, that is accelerated. But it maintains city council oversight and may be important, it aligns practices with other cities. In most cities, the city manager has full discretion over these types of personnel decisions for all city employees, other than the city attorney who's also selected by the city council. So how is that implemented? Pretty simple here. What we did is we replaced the mandated review of all of these types of personnel decisions in all cases with a requirement that in all cases, a confidential notification go out to the city council of a proposed personnel decision that falls in this category. And then there's a three day window. And if, the, if a member of the city council requests within three days a review of that decision, then that review gets placed on the next available city council agenda. The decision doesn't take place until the city council decides to approve or not approve it. If no review is requested within three days, then it can go forward and be implemented. And we think this is a sort of a more efficient way of getting to the same, to the same square. This last slide, I wish I hadn't put in the PowerPoint presentation because it's obviously a lot of, uh, of language. These are these, the specific changes, but it really includes the same content as was on the implementation slide. Uh, with that, I'll answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for that presentation, and I'm glad I was able to find you. Um, <laughs> this time I'll turn to Council Member Quo, who would like to speak first to the item. Thank you so much. Mr. Melching, um, I'm assuming you're going to find this answer more quickly than I will. I just want to sort of, this is a little bit of self-preservation. In the, in the um, proposal, it says that the City manager shall have the authority to promote, appoint, remove, promote, and demote any and all officers. And then later it says it's city officers defined in um, charter section 700. Are council members and they are elected council members and the mayor not include, are we not officers of the city or is not. there like a specific mm -hmm. ex exemption? You're not, you're in a different category. You're not, a, you're not, you're not an officer of the city. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, heaven for heaven that forbid, in the most respectful way. Us. Heaven forbid the day that the city manager decide to to remove or demote me. Um, That's the voters. Yeah. Uh, then later on it says the city manager sh shall provide confidential notice. Are we delineating how that notice is provided? We are not. Uh, we are not. I would expect that in the normal case it would be provided in, in writing, mm -hmm. um, but we did not specify that it must be provided in writing because I know the city, city manager communicates with council members in various ways. Okay. And then similarly, how is the, the objection of a council member recorded? We did require that that be done in writing because we have the, a three-day hard limit on it, and it may, we thought that that would make it easier from a council member's standpoint that at any point in the three days to just deliver that writing and know that you've satisfied the requirements. So my question is, and this is certainly not a, um, any reflection on Mr. Russo, is if the council members have a three-day deadline, how do we know when the three days begin if there's no official notification? That's a that's a that's a that's an absolutely uh, fair fair uh, fair point. And to that end, if you if if it were the council's pleasure, we could add the requirement that the notice be provided in writing, or that it be provided simultaneously, and that the city manager document the time of providing that notice. Either one of those things would address the issue that you raised. And then my third question, third and final question on this, is again I'm not trying to be obnoxious and technical. Three days, is that three calendar days? Is that three business days? I just want to know that if, uh, to, to reserve that right to object and to not miss the deadline or to. It's three calendar days. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member Quo, and we'll turn to Council Member Khan. I think Council Member Quo um, asked most of my questions, but I do want to specify it somewhere um, how we will receive um, the notice if there's a time on there, a time stamp or something, so that we know exactly how many days we have left to respond. Okay. Thank you. That's a good point. Okay, with that, any other uh, questions? Um, so I'll turn to the city clerk. Do we have any speakers for the item? No, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, with that, I would like to uh, entertain a motion. If that, there's one on the floor, please. Is so there? Moved. <laughs> we need to wake up. No, okay, I was there's, a, <laughs> there's, a, there's a motion by Council Member Fox. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Khan. A any other um, comments or thoughts? Okay, with that, please vote. I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem. I apologize. We need to read into the record the title of the of the uh, well, proposed ordinance. Well, if the maker of the motion wasn't asleep, she would have done that properly. <laughs> <laughs> I will move the ordinance approving amendments to the Irvine Municipal Code to authorize the city manager to appoint, remove, promote, or demote city officers and department heads. Thank you for clarifying. Move to approve. And the second, okay, great. With that, let's vote. You did vote and the motion passed four to zero with Wagner, Mayor Wagner absent. In spite of that clarification, we already voted. So there we go, look how great you are. Okay, great. So now we will move to item 3.5.3. Yes. Oh, city manager, you had something to say? Just really briefly, although I, it breaks my rule of never say something after you prevailed on a motion. Um, <laughs> I know that there's some concern about um, placing any specifics in writing. So my intention so that we can handle the concern that I think was well stated by council member Quo um, is I will call each council member with details and then I'll send an email confirming just as a confirmation today we spoke about one of the items that falls under this particular ordinance okay. and that'll note. That'll and so if you record. get that email and I didn't speak to you then you'll say well, well what did you do? And you'll send me back an email in the call. And then we'll demote start. you, and then we'll fix everything just really well. You don't have to go through any process for that. <laughs> we love you. We're not going to do that. Okay, so at this time, thank you for the clarification. That's appreciated. At this time, we'll move to item th uh, 5.3, consideration of Council Member Quo's request regarding National Volunteer Week and a million-hour challenge. And I'll turn to you, Council Member Quo. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure to offer this item this evening. So as uh, some of my colleagues uh, might be aware, um, at least when I am out in the, the public, I get 
comments once in a while. They're not very friendly comments, but they're comments that, that kind of go along the lines of, people in Irvine don't do very much, you don't serve in the community, you don't help out. And that's a characterization that I, I just don't agree with. Um, we hear all, oftentimes that, um, you know, Irvine just doesn't step up and just doesn't do our, our fair share. And I, again, I, I just don't agree with that. I've been involved, I know every member of this council has been involved for many, many years in so many different um, nonprofit organizations, um, faith-based organizations, service groups. And so I wanted to bring this item forward. Um, April 7th through 13th this year um, will be designated as National Volunteer Week. So I wanted to ask the council to proclaim that week and I've included a, a, sample, pro a sample proclamation um, the second thing is I'd like to issue a challenge to the residents of Irvine to volunteer one million hours of community service. Um, we're a city of nearly 300,000 residents. Surely, you know, my, my little nephew who's three is, is not going to be rendering that many hours of community service. Um, but we have a lot of wonderful, able-bodied individuals that can serve and have been serving. Um, so that's, that's part of that challenge. Step three and four, and, and I apologize, colleagues, if it sounded a little onerous. All I'm looking for uh, is like a little widget on our website where someone can go in and say, my name is Anthony Quo. I spent two hours volunteering at Second Harvest Food Bank or at the Irvine Junior Games or with the 211 Marine Adoption Committee. Uh, for my purposes, I have zero interest in regulating or approving which nonprofits uh, qualify. I think this is really kind of an honor system thing. Um, I, I want people to um, just get involved in their community. I get a lot of calls, and as I'm sure colleagues you do as well, from various groups and individuals who say, I want to volunteer, I have a group of 15, or I'm doing an Eagle project, or I'm doing something, and we, they look to us to sometimes point them in the right direction. So I want to kind of create that format too, where we have kind of a clearinghouse, and I understand Community Services already has a list online um, to be able to do that. The other component that goes with the website, and I'm just a little bit old fashioned, not only on the website, but here in City Hall, I would like for you know, our, our very talented staff to, to make me, make us a giant thermometer. We've all seen it, you know, at churches where they're doing capital campaigns. I want people to come into City Hall and say, great, we're at 10,000 hours, we're at 50,000 hours, we're at 250,000 hours. It's a very visible thing, certainly one in the lobby, but two also uh, on the website. Four, I, item four I kind of already addressed is you know, we're not looking for, for our staff to spend too much time placing volunteers. Just kind of an update, and I don't know how often that, that list is updated, but you know, if somebody calls and says, I wanna get involved, we can send them to a, a, a website and you don't have to use my words, it might be cityofirvine.org slash Irvine serves or something like that. Um, I just think that this is a, a step that we can take that's very positive in the community, that highlights the good work that's already being done, and yet um, yet again encourages uh, more service to be rendered. And with that, um, I'll, I'll move the item, and certainly if there uh, are questions of, of my colleagues, I'm, I'm here. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll second your motion for discussion. Um, so at this time, are there any other comments from council members? Um, we're supportive. Do, we seem to be supportive. As My only concern was, and I appreciate that you addressed it, that it doesn't become um, so staff intensive that we're using too much of staff time, but it sounds like the way you've um, rolled it out and talked to community services that it can really... Yeah. Um, so I don't want to put them on the spot, but I know our, our community services, we already have a list of nonprofits on our website, and I know our, our new director of human resources, she stumbled upon, um, I actually didn't look very carefully because it was your private phone and I didn't want to be too snoopy so overtly, um, but she had, uh, Ms. Medina had a an, an app on her phone where she could 
you could actually go on and do that. Absolutely. And say, this is so my name, to answer this the question, staff has the capability of putting something together relatively quickly. Um, something that I found was actually from the Boston University, very simple. It, it's a quick link where it's Boston University slash million hour challenge. Someone can then go to, it'll track the hours. It'll list the hours that the students have served. You can click add your hours. And when you click add your hours, it goes to the next screen where the person puts in their name, their email, the organization that they served. And again, on an honor system, the service hours, and you click add my hours. Very simple and oh, something that great. we can implement. Well, holy heck, if Boston <laughs> University can do it, so can Irvine. I just know it. So can I just ask a quick question? If we get to the million uh, volunteer hours and someone has exceeded everybody, do, do we have a prize or is there some kind of certificate or what, what is the plan to recognize these individuals? I'm, I'm totally open for discussion. Like I said, I just think it's a good chance for people to give back and and serve in their community. Maybe they can have a free ride on the balloon. Yeah, is, we can take them. I'm <laughs> happy to take them up on the balloon. <laughs> okay, so with that, there's um, no and, they, and they can choose whether I'm on the ride with them or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a motion and a second on the floor. Any further discussion? Let's please vote. I'm voting, but it's not is it coming up. Okay, good. Passes unanimously with Mayor Wagner absent. Okay, wonderful. Well, I really like the idea. Thank you so much for your creativity. I think that it's good to have some new ideas and, and new adventures in front of us. So thank you so much. Okay, at this time we'll move to public comments. Do I have public comments or? Yes, Mayor, Pro Mayor Pro Tem, do you see them on your screen? If not, I can read them. Uh, no, I uh, don't. I just public comments but there's no names here okay nobody with the, in the queue okay. you, why don't you announce them for me thank you okay. um brigitte first followed by Ilya seglin uh, honorable council and madam uh, mayor um there was a time for a uh, pedal to the metal and a time for abundance of caution today on 4.1, thank God we had one voice of reason, was a, a time for abundance of caution. Uh, this was not uh, vetted out enough where you could just, you know, slam dunk it. I, that's my opinion. Because what you, what you basically have done, if you make it easier for code enforcement to intrude on a homeowner's uh, home, you're also making it easier for a neighbor to turn in another neighbor. That's exactly what they did in Nazi Germany. Get neighbor to be a deputy, and you want a, na a neighborhood to go to hell in a handbag? Do that, because then you'll get a lot, you're just uh, feeding, fueling the fire. That's why I'm standing here. I've got 161 criminal complaints as <coughs> attorney general of a RICO operation in Orange County because a neighbor met with my mom in secret uh, and, and called Adult Protective Services. And she retaliated against me because I allowed my elderly mom to sell my dad's old tools that were worth maybe a hundred bucks, old tools, but she thought she was entitled to it. She called the police department. This is when I lived in Oceanside. And uh, are you kidding me? And she retaliated because I, and I, I told my mom, I said, you could sell it to the man in the moon. It's your, you know, that's your call. I didn't want to, she's elderly and, you know, you feel the rights are being taken away as you get older. And I, I wanted to preserve that. Say, that's your call. That's all it took. One foreclosure, yeah, one property. And instead, to take the estate, they said three or four properties were in foreclosure. One property in foreclosure, online to be paid and brought current. And that's all it took. And then they fabricate the other to exigent mortgage crisis. So I'm talking about personal experience. You don't want people with clipboards in your home. It's never going to turn out good. 100%. That's no exception to the rule. You do not want a clipboard in your home. Uh, and what happened today is just making grease in the skids. It's a slippery slope. 
Uh, I think the fruit of this is not going to be good because it's just going to have to pit neighbor against neighbor, and that's not what you want. If you've got problems in your neighborhood, work it out with your neighbor. You don't always got to call the government, you know, help me. Work it out. What, what, what happened to self-reliance? You know, talk, most neighbors don't even know who their next door neighbor is until the, f the house is on fire. You know, a crisis. So that's my two bits. Thank you. Who's our next speaker? Um, yes, Mr. Seglin does not seem to be here, so Ms. Sayer. Yes, good evening. Um, my name is Susan Sayer, and I'm a longtime Irvine resident. I'm also a retired social worker who periodically worked with members of the homeless population. Once a month, I and fellow church members cook and share dinner with the women residing in a Santa Ana homeless shelter. Irvine is the subject of a federal lawsuit for failure to provide shelters for the homeless. Note that Mayor Wagner in his State of the City address touted the decrease in Irvine's homeless population by 75%. Since the analyzed results of the last homeless count have not been released, I sincerely question the accuracy of his report. Mayor Wagner also touted all the wonderful affordable housing that Irvine is providing for Irvine's homeless population. Oh, Mr. Wagner, the homeless cannot afford to pay the affordable rental rates or even the very low income rates. The homeless need shelter and services now. They cannot wait months and years on the waiting list for these residences. They need shelter and support services, such as state vocational rehabilitation services, assistance with obtaining the various benefits that are available, mental health services, alcohol and substance abuse services now. Responsibility for providing shelters and services for the homeless population must not be left to the faith community and local nonprofits. It's time for the city of Irvine to step up and provide shelter and services to members of the homeless population. The shelters need to be located near public transportation, shopping centers, and a post office where they can receive their benefit checks. The shelter should be located where there is easy access to public library, which has computers that the members of the homeless population can use for job applications and communication with family, friends, and various services. As a result of falling on hard times, many members of the homeless population need to rebuild self-confidence and self-esteem. Perhaps Irvine can help them feel that they have something to contribute to the world by creating a volunteer public service program whereby physically and mentally healthy members of the homeless population can be assigned to volunteer jobs with the city or nonprofits located within the city. Thank you. And Mr. Quo, perhaps they can put a tag a little um, um, a, a contribute job hours to put on your little thermometer. That's wonderful. I love that. <laughs> Good idea. Okay, we come to adjournment. I want to just thank our staff for staying so late and being so great uh, presenting tonight. And uh, at this, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. There's a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. See you in two weeks. Thank you. <laughs>